Okay, we're going live on LMC's YouTube right now.
Oh, Betty Ann, I, I understood that earlier in the day, uh, Andrew was going to communicate with you about uh, the citizen correspondence and the uh, DPW item. Did, he did, the, not. Uh, did the attached let? Oh, okay. All right, we may have to. Um, may have to do some housekeeping on that that was i i okay. probably should have asked the that the the letter go up with the photos i uh, i think i miscommunicated on that okay Uh, Tony Geller will be joining in a moment. He just uh, needed the new uh, link, so I just sent it to him. Yeah, I keyed it in manually off the agenda. It worked just fine. How are you? Sure, how have you been? Five of seven, and as far as I know, we're expecting two more.
Hey, Bev? Andrew will be joining in a moment too. Um, whoever called in, if you could just shoot me an email real quick and just let me know who you are. If it's Doreen, I'll uh, unmute you. Uh, my email address is gcutler, G-C-U-T-L-E-R, at vomni.org. That's V-O-M-N-Y dot O-R-G. I'm going to unmute that number. Of, I think it might be Doreen, but I'll, I'll allow you to talk for a moment. Is that you? Yes, Greg. Three, you, you got <laughs> okay. me. Good. <laughs> okay. We now have all commissioners present. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, it's a, it's a difficult time, and we're, uh, we're operating under unusual circumstances, appearing virtually, um, adding a strange twist to the, the volunteer public service that we all do. Uh, thanks for your time, all the village staff. I know you folks are all uh, at home trying to work remotely like the rest of us, as many of us have been doing for eight or 10 weeks now. It's, um, it's not fun. It's not a circumstance we chose, but uh, we're, we're doing our duties as best we can despite those, those considerations. I hope everyone is, is safe and well. Uh, I know not everybody is. Or people all around us who've had exposures or gotten sick the way we're living now, and I hope nobody's suffering too serious a consequence. Uh, can I get a motion to open the meeting? So moved. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. And the motion, and the meeting is open. We have um, 
once again tonight, uh, we're meeting virtually and uh, the agenda that's posted gives a Zoom link for anybody that wants to participate that way. Uh, this is also uh, streaming on YouTube uh, for folks that wanna watch that way. There is call-in participation for any public portions of the meeting and there will be some discussion items after the applicants are up. Um, and with that, I think we can call, we have two applicants tonight and then we have a number of work session items. But before we get to them, uh, Betty Ann, I wanted to address a, a housekeeping issue. Uh, there was some discussion uh, with the staff before about uh, what to post concerning the DPW item in the, in the work session. And uh, I think what we what I finally uh, communicated was that the uh, was that the uh, photographs of the Columbus Park work should go up. I, what I should have communicated was that the, the citizen correspondence should go up too. And I think that was my error. Um, it, if it would be possible to load that during the meeting before that item comes up, that would be awesome. If not, we'll, I guess we'll have to address it after in some other way. But, um, you know, there are a lot of citizens in this village who uh, pay a lot of attention to this stuff and believe strongly in citizen transparency and they're not wrong. So uh, I think it's in particular, I think the only the only correspondence we received, the only written uh, materials we received in addition to the pictures were Stuart Tekerts. Um, we should we should make his uh, his uh, letter a part of the record. Uh, while we were waiting for the rest of the commissioners to join the meeting, I already posted those documents. So the agenda is live with everything there. Thank you. And once again, the delay was was me just not sufficiently communicating, and I apologize for that to anyone. Not a problem. Didn't have a chance to uh, didn't have a chance to review it as thoroughly as they would have liked. Okay, so we have uh, we have two applicants. We have the marine structures permit aspects of one shore road, and we should uh, bring them up. Thomas, Hi. I have a question for you. Yes, what's the question? Uh, in reviewing the materials, they're still incomplete. And I'm wondering if we should table hmm. this until we get complete information. I don't well, know if everybody else is that way. Um, that's a discussion we're going to have to have. Hmm. It's, uh, and so since, since I know what your question is, your question will be first. Mr. Chair, may I begin? If, can, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to take a mo moment of personal privilege and ask everybody to hang on for just a sec. I'm going to basement where I could just grab a can of seltzer. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes. All right. Kristen Motel from the law firm Cuddy and Fader on behalf of the applicant. I know it's been about five months since I last appeared before you. I bet you didn't think you'd see me again on this application, but I'm back for maternity leave and I'm hoping that we can bring this to a resolution tonight. Um, you will recall we were last before you in April when the consistency determination was issued for upland portions of this project. Uh, and as you had mentioned, we're here tonight for the marine structures permit um, for the proposed boat lift dock, pier, kayak dock, uh, portion of the seawall restoration and restoration of the existing gazebo. Um, we did provide, as Commissioner Rooney indicated, a submission to you regarding these structures. Uh, we believe addressing all of the requested information. Um, and this is our fifth appearance before this commission, uh, 11th overall on this project. So, you know, we, the, the record is quite extensive here. Um, so we request that you take action tonight on our uh, marine structures permit application. 
So I, you're right that this is a very lengthy record and, and also in, in some ways a, an extremely unorthodox application in that um, it's, it's one of only a few, maybe the only one where uh, such substantial work has been done under emergency permits uh, while the process is ongoing. It's, it's left us in, in uh, a rare, if not unprecedented situation where the project is is underway and evolving while we're determining consistency and that's led to a number of things including lengthy explanations of the process uh, of what's gone on or is going on as we go uh, to make sure that the applicant for example isn't outside the bounds of of their uh, emergency permits it's uh, put us on a, a very strange procedural footing and we have done the best we can with a very strange procedural footing uh, we realize that it has been many, many meetings. We're all aware of that. Uh, we don't like to have extra meetings if we don't need to. We like to be decisive. And yet here we are. Uh, I know for sure that uh, Commissioner Roney has questions about the completeness of the application. Uh, so I'm just going to let her go ahead and address that. Well, first of all, we don't have the additional information for the marine structures on the seawall um, as to what has been completed and what needs to be under our purview for review. We also do not have complete information on the harbor management plan aspects of what is required for submission in compliance with uh, 24021. And I'll just say for 24021, the code B, um, the application for the permit is submitted to the building department and once it's determined that it complies in material respect with all applicable submission requirements which are found in the harbor management plan and they're not complete <laughs> um, it shall be referred to our commission so i'm not understanding uh who reviewed it and deemed it complete enough to come back to our agenda last meeting i outlined chapter and verse with much detail of what would be a required, what would our requirements be for the submission, but um, all we received were memoranda. And uh, I noticed on the marine structures permit, the docking facility, the um, boat lift, there's new information. Piles, additional piles were added, and there's a proposed use of the east side of the float which is outside the applicant's boundary for guest mooring. So every, time we, every time we've had this application, new information has been submitted. In February, a uh, floodplain variance was uh, issued uh, or uh, applied for. Uh, we have had a moving application since the applicant has appeared on our agenda where there's no final end to new information on the submissions. So I would like to, I don't know if all commissioners feel this way, um, review the complete final plan when we have all the submission material, when this you know, continual process of more different information and change up happens. So I'd like to know when that's going to end and when we're going to have a final, complete, accurate submission. Commissioner Bruni. Uh, go, go, go ahead and address that. Uh, I will, I'll take these one at a time. Um, we do have our coastal engineer uh, available at the meeting who she can speak to some of these questions. Um, we have not changed any aspect of our proposal now for, for quite some time. We did submit, uh, to your point about 24021, a building permit application was submitted um, as part of the municipal consultation process that took place before we submitted to the Harbor Coastal Commission. So that was with staff and that building permit application was provided in our September 13th submission to this, to this board. Uh, so that's already been taken care of. Uh, Azure, if you would like to address the questions about the ongoing seawall work. Well, first of all, well, I, hang I'd on. like- Bo Yeah, hang, hang on. Doreen said something 
quite a bit more specific, which is uh, 24021B. And uh, she's yeah. paying a lot more attention to that than I, I am, but we walked through that at the last meeting. And uh, so I, I figure you're probably prepared to walk through uh, how the submissions to date uh, meet all the requirements to 24021B. 24021B requires an application for the marine structure be submitted to the building department and it be referred to the Harbor Coastal Commission. Uh, we submitted a building permit application and it was referred to this commission. So if you could provide clarification on where you think we're lacking. That's correct. My point is, is I gave the applicant's representatives at the last meeting, chapter and verse, pages of information in the Harbor Management Plan, which are required submissions. A list, pages, exactly what needed to be done. My question isn't as to whether or not you submitted the application. My point is, is the building department, upon receipt of information, needs to deem all materials complete. And what I'm saying is, is we still have a vast amount, as I outlined at the last meeting, of information that we do not have. So we, we received a completeness determination from staff and that's how we were able to proceed to this commission. We did cite all of the har harbor management plan policies that you had mentioned during the last meeting and in our experience, this is the first time an applicant's been asked to go through and address response to response for this harbor management plan. And, and that's what we've done. So if you want to go through and, and maybe I can point out where we've responded to your concerns, because we did make a complete submission on this. Well, first of all, as far as the um, property itself, yeah. from the submission that you sent, all we have is a letter from the title company Stating that they can to, we don't have any information on the end game of that. So, so, so we have a letter from. If if I if I may address that, we have a letter from the title company, but we also provided a signed and sealed amended survey that reflects an uncovered 1932 boundary line agreement and shows the rights that we have to this property. So, and there's nothing else to provide. We have provided the professional survey. I have a letter from the title company that says same. It, is, is there other issues that are related to the Harbor Management Plan policies? Which survey are you referring to, Jacoby? I'm referring to the survey that was included in our May 6th submission. Uh, it was done by Ward Carpenter Surveyors. And the date on that should be May 6, 2020. Um, hang it's on. Exhibit B to our May 6 submission. Uh, hang on, I'm looking. I believe that one of my fellow commissioners had a long discussion early in this application about a certified title. Um, and I'm looking for the letter. Hang on one second. There was a letter from the title company saying that the certificate of title was forthcoming. I have since received that certificate of title that says what the letter says and it, it jives with the survey. Do we have that? Yes, no, it you says says we've been, been advised from our field examiner that our examination of title for the above reference premises should be returned to our office this afternoon. To this end, we anticipate being able to provide your certificate of title either late afternoon or tomorrow morning. Of course, I am unable to give further guarantee until such time as my underwriting team has the opportunity to review the search. So we're kind of up in the air with that. So I have the certificate of title given the circumstances of COVID-19. There was a delay in the title company getting us that letter. However, there's no change in circumstance. You, and you have the, the signed and sealed professional survey, which reflects what the certificate of title says. Um, so, I mean, we could go through the other issues that you have with our, our harbor management plan responses, but this really is a non-issue anymore. 
What was the exhibit, I'm sorry, that you mentioned the new survey was? Um, it B. was, thank you, exhibit B. B, I'm sorry. B. So the, the cover letter is the first file in the um, in the packet. Uh, second file is Exhibit A. Third file is Exhibit B. There's B1 and there's B2. B1 is the drawing and B2 is the description. And there's B3. I'm trying and B3 to know the is brand. Drawing. I'm only, I, Exhibit B of what date? May 6th. It's the survey of the property uh, dated March 30, 2017. Is that correct? Uh, it's been since amended, but yeah. it's exactly. Added May four, add, it was amended May 2020, May 8th, I believe it is. Uh, May 6th, yes, correct. May 6th, I can't say it, I'm sorry. Uh, it's okay. There it is, survey highlighting. So your title company issued you a letter. They issued us and a certificate of title that should that reflects our rights to the property that are shown on that survey. They offered you and where's where's the submission of talking to the underwater land grant property owner and uh, working that all out so for where's, both the, for the kayak dock. Sorry, Kristen, for both the marine structure and the gazebo work. Uh, it would just be for the, the proposed kayak dock. The survey was amended to incorporate the gazebo based on that boundary line agreement, which specifically addresses the gazebo as, as the reason for that boundary line agreement. Um, and we, we do not have permission from the existing underlying property owner for the kayak dock. We're in the process of obtaining their authorization. We need that authorization to get uh, also the DEC permit for that kayak dock. So we would request this commission, and I, and I know it's something that you don't typically do, but we would ask that you approve the kayak dock on the condition that we get all required state and federal permits and the required underlying property owner's authorization, which is required for those permits anyway. Um, and the, the Well, the DEC other issue is there's Spartina. There's Spartina in the vicinity of where that kayak dock is going and you need to have an agreement with the underwater land land grantee with that um you know i know dec did that for you uh over a year ago but things really haven't moved in the past year to secure that agreement so i as one commissioner wouldn't be inclined to condition a consistency determination I, there's I, a lot wanted, more to go I want to jump in here because it, this was an issue I had intended to raise. And as long as we're talking about it, we should talk about it. What What does it mean that you're in the process of securing agreement from the underwater landowner? First of all, who who is the under? Remind us who the underwater landowner that is there at the at the location of the gazebo. Peter, is this something that you you want me to address? Yeah, I, you I'm ha I'm happy I'm happy okay. to address the issue. And so the, the only issue that the, DE, the DEC has no issue, the DEC granted it. They, wanted, they basically are saying that because there's an underwater uh, land uh, owner of that area outside of the gazebo, uh, that we would need their permission before we put the dock in. We will not put the dock in without their permission. Uh, the, the issue is what I'd like to do is, is uh, secure that at a time that is mutually agreeable between the landowner uh, and myself and the dilemma that I've had. Uh, if you want, if, if we really need to air this out publicly, you're forcing me to do it, uh, is the, the landowner uh, from the very beginning has been a, a critic of the project, incessantly calling the building department, complaining about everything to do with the project. And it was my determination that what I want to do is get the thing uh, done and, and then go to him at some point and, 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 uh, and, and chat to him about it and try and uh, resolve it. But it hasn't seemed to be a particularly uh, opportune time to do it when everything that happens in that property has been something the subject of a complaint. So I just wanna be really clear about something. It, there's nothing that's gonna happen vis-a-vis -vis it. David, you wanna say something before I keep going? No, there, there's, there's nothing that's going to happen on the dock 
clearly and specifically without his agreement. What I'm asking for is a conditional uh, 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 determination that 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 you that the, the commission is fine with that doc being there, and we all know that nothing gets done without his agreement. But, it, but I just want to explain something. This stuff is very very difficult to do uh, when 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 somebody has been hostile to just the simple house going up. And he's been at this commission, and he's and he's and he's appeared before you to complain about every aspect of of, of, of the boat lift. And now he hasn't been on anything since. And so, so what I'm asking for is a conditional approval. And and again, nothing happens without his agreement to it. Well, there are other issues too because I know when we visited the site, there's Spartina along the gazebo in certain places. There are no specific plans on what is going to be done to the gazebo. I know you discussed raising the floor. If you can point me in the direction where the, this is noted on a plan submission about all the work on the gazebo and exactly where the Spartina yeah. is in relationship to that. The, um, Spart the Spartina is nowhere near where the dock would go. And I, I want to be very clear about this gazebo, and, and it's a misunderstanding. Uh, uh, I could literally just leave the gazebo sit there and take the structure down. I, I just want to be really clear about it. this is going to cost me somewhere between uh, 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 55 to 100 grand. And the only reason why I'm doing it, the only reason why is somebody in a, in a wistful moment said to the architect, geez, do you think he might keep that gazebo there? Because that gazebo was there on surveys going back to 1920 or 1930. So I said to the architect, Yes, you know what, if, if somebody would like, and it's the way I've handled this thing from the very beginning, if someone would, like me, someone would like me to do that because it makes people feel better in the town because it was something that was there on maps going back to the 1930s you know, or 40s, whatever it was, I will spend the money to do it. I just want to be really clear with everybody. If people don't want me to do that, I will literally either leave it alone or I will just simply take the roof down, which is a danger, and it can just sit there. I was doing it as a favor. It costs real money. And if people don't want me to do it, I won't do it. I will leave it sit like that. And so just to be clear, and, 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 and that we don't Maureen, to Maureen, let, let me finish, don't have let me finish, let me finish. All right, I was doing it as a favor. There's no Spartina in the way. And we have been so fastidious and so careful with everything around that environmental area. And at this point now, it's a level of pure obstruction on this project. And we've done everything here. And I also want to just say something up front too. The emergency permit and, the, and, 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 and any tiny increments beyond that emergency permit have been de minimis now for months and months on end. And we also, Doreen, just to your comments earlier, we've had meetings where we ended, where my attorney asked, are there any other questions or anything else for us to address? And there was nothing that came from this board. And then, as, and then I, I have all the respect in the world for Chairman Burt, who then said later, things come up. And so we've tried to address them. But here, if people want me to leave that gazebo alone, I will leave it. We will knock the roof down and it'll stay. And I'm done. Mr. Gross, we do not have the specific plans on what you're doing to the gazebo, as far as it's I see in the record. In your packet. The, 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 excuse me, the architect wrote something that should have been in your packet. So I Commissioner remember. Rooney, we think, yes, Peter, we, um, is correct. We submitted uh, numerous submissions on our gazebo plans. The first being your December 4th, 2019 submission. That also cited the National Park Service guidelines for restoration of an older structure. Uh, the submission went through how we were complying with those guidelines. And then in the May 6th submission, there was another letter from our architect, Ira Granberg, on the plans that were being proposed for the gazebo. So can you tell and me which, the, can you please tell me which plan sheet the gazebo rest, restoration um, shows me what's being done? Ira, would you like to walk through your plans for Commissioner Rooney? I'm not sure what you have on your packet. Originally, we were just going to restore the gazebo to its original condition and repair the damage to the gazebo. Uh, and in my letter to you, I believe it was May 6th, I'm, I'm not sure of the date, um, I made it very clear that our goal was to repair and 
structurally uh, replace components that were uh, near collapse, and we were leaving it at that. The shape of the roof, the materials used would all be in kind, and that was basically the scope of what we were going to do. Right. They were, they've been in the form of letters, okay, not the actual plans. There was also mention that you are raising the floor 12 inches. That's correct. And that was, Usually, pretty, that was predicated on discussions we had with the commission at the site that the intent was to raise the slab to prevent uh, water inundation within the structure to, to protect the posts of the structure. It was not to violate the perimeter of the structure or enlarge the structure. It was merely done to protect the structure. And that was a, a discussion we all had, which at the time was one of, of repair, not a new structure. Exactly, and, uh, but this maybe is the Azure. reason understanding is, is that under normal, normal circumstances, when you get a site plan, there's existing conditions, and then there are the work that's going to be done. In all of your submissions, I see absolutely nothing as to what's going to be done. An arrow, so on and so forth, pointing to this is how we're going to accomplish this restoration, repair, whatever you wish to call it. It's not on any plan sheets. Uh, this is Azure Slicer from Race, and the uh, the gazebo rest part of the gazebo restoration as it pertains to the floor and portions that are um, within the DEC jurisdiction, including the kayak dock, are all shown on Race's plans. Um, you have uh, four sheets; they're shown on sheet four of four. Right, but it doesn't point to it points to the floor, doesn't it? And the kayak dock. And, and the and the stone uh pillars that are uh going to uh replace the timber posts. Right. So um there's no roof. It's gonna be replaced in kind. I mean those things need to be documented on the plan. That's why I was confused. Oh. Okay, I want to interject because I, I thought that I had a clear understanding of what was going to happen with the gazebo except for the kayak dock. Because as I understood it, the gazebo is going to be an in-kind, in-place in replacement except for the raised floor and stone pillars instead of the no longer serviceable wood ones. Am I correct or incorrect? You are correct. Okay. All right, now I understand. So that's indicated on the notes in the plan because I didn't find that either. The floor, the pillars are on race's plan and there's a note that refers to architectural plans for any gazebo details beyond that um, and, the, and the kayak dock. And I just want to mention one thing about the proposed kayak dock location uh, is that there is no Spartina in uh, the particular location off the gazebo that we've chosen and that was um, that location was also worked out with DEC. Uh, again, it's not been permitted by them, but from a technical perspective, uh, we had it originally off of a different location on the gazebo uh, through our review process with them. It was relocated to a different um, corner of the gazebo where there is no Spartina, such that DEC was fine from a technical perspective and only requires the uh, permission from the lands underwater owner uh, in order to modify the permit that we have to include the, the kayak dock. And that's where so things the were DEC, left the DEC. DEC wouldn't issue you a conditional permit based on you receiving, um, you know, the agreement on uh, the kayak dock. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Uh, they don't issue, uh, as far as we know, conditional permits. Uh, so they wanted to have the, uh, but they said it would be no problem to modify it. They could issue a one page letter modification uh, as soon as we got that permission. Do we have uh, access to a written record that the only thing the DEC permits contingent on is that approval? We have some uh, email exchanges that uh, discuss that among other things. So it's a very lengthy email string that um, that does include that as part of uh, in additional, you know, exchanges back and forth um, with respect to the project. Has that been provided to us yet? I don't believe so. Uh, Kristen, did that uh, make it into the? 
there were email exchanges that were provided in preparation for the April meeting. Um, I have to see if they, if the extent of them, because it was a very long email chain, um, but it was highlighting D DEC did review our plans for the kayak dock. So they, I, the changes were made to the design based on DEC preferences. I, I need to jump in here. Hypothetically, if we are if we vote uh, consistency conditional on the underwater landowner's permission, and it is absolutely not available, what then happens to the gazebo? Well, the gazebo is on our client's property. It's the kayak dock that we would need the permission for. Right. So, what what then happens to the gazebo? The gazebo gets uh, the gazebo gets restored without without a kayak dock, and uh, and Mr. You, Gross finds you, another yeah. place to launch the kayaks. Yes. If you Correct. if we if you if you agree to the condition that I have to obtain the uh, underwater odors uh, uh, underwater landowners consent, uh, I don't touch anything to do with that dock until I get that consent. But I will go forward. And I will, in kind, uh, replace that gazebo so that it provides to the to the village uh, the the same dynamic that was enjoyed at that property before it fell under disrepair, going back, you know, uh, 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 more than a century here. Can I ask a quick question about the gazebo dock? Yep. Um, is the gazebo dock affixed to the bottom of that mill pond anyway, or is it just attached to that concrete slab of the gazebo? It would only be attached to the concrete slab, and we did have discussion with DEC about that, um, and they still felt that even though it was technically floating and not touching the bottom, that they still wanted the land underwater owner's uh, authorization. But it would, it, would no, it would in no way be touching the bottom. And, okay. and Com Commissioner Maggio, just for what it's worth, I, I had myself uh, extensive dialogue with the DEC about that uh, because we're not touching any part of that uh, ocean floor, of that, that floor in the pond. Uh, and their contention was I still needed to get it. And I said, respectfully, I understood. It's from, because from my, it's over the water. Go ahead, Doreen. I'm sorry, I thought you heard me. It's because it's over the well, water I'm, and that water, th those water rights belong to the rightful yeah. owner. All right, can, can I finish my statement here? From what I understand about littoral rights, you have riparian rights and littoral, littoral rights. Riparian rights um, are attributed to rivers and streams and littoral or literal rights have to do with coastlines. If the underwater lands are owned, that doesn't preclude you from launching a, a, a kayak as long as you don't touch the bottom. That the minute, the minute you touch the bottom with an oar or an anchor or your foot or the hull of your kayak, you're, you're, you're liable for trespass and, and the other, and the person who owns the underwater lands um, have a private cause of action against you. So, um, you know, I, whether there's a kayak, dock, whether there's a dock there or not, I don't think you can be stopped from actually launching from that gazebo pad. That you know, I don't think that's in dispute, and we don't we don't control the use. We're we're ruling here on a marine structures permit, not on not on whether he can launch a kayak, whether but whether he can build a kayak launch that is on top of the water, overland someone else owns, and yeah. so. Well, as well, far as that goes, we we have two choices. We can we can vote it consistent with a condition, or we can vote it not consistent. But can we're I, make, uh, but we can't control the launch. Can I make one other point what? on that too? Just because Commissioner Madre, you're saying something that's really important, and I want to address the whole reason why I wanted to put the dock in was to avoid ever hitting the 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 ground. So all along that pond. In, independent of this discussion, and I respect so much the, the, the goodwill of people who have the right uh, intentions on this thing. There's so, it's ubiquitous all across that pond that you've got a whole bunch of people constantly launching their, their kayaks and canoes, and they are hitting the bottom. The whole reason for me to put that, uh, that, that extra dock in 
was to try to avoid what everyone across that pond keeps doing, which is hitting the bottom. So I, I want to be really mindful of it. So yes, I absolutely could go pull anytime I wanted off the property. I could go jump in the water in a kayak. I was trying to be a responsible steward of the area. And that's, that's guided everything we've done. And so that, I just want you to know that was the idea of it. You know, I, I, I understand okay. that. Look, but my point is the DEC's jurisdiction is DEC. In terms of, of the LWRP, if that kayak dock doesn't touch the bottom, right, as far as the LWRP goes, I think it's, it's a different set of circumstances. If, if DEC, says, DEC says you need uh, permission for that, that's, that's the DEC's department, that, that's the regulation. But as far as at least my opinion of this, my understanding of the law is that you can have a dock there and you, you can you can launch from there as long as you don't touch the bottom because because touching the bottom is, is like walking across someone else's yard it's not your property the, the water above you have every right to use okay thank you i, I take are you talking about so, uh, okay Dor uh, doreen I, if you if you can i I, I called you first because I knew there. I knew you wanted to talk about completeness of uh, of the application, et cetera. If you can, if you can wrap up what you've got, because I want to make sure anybody that wants to address this application has the chance, and the, and then we can keep it moving. I have a very long list. I did provide the applicant with all of the pages and documentation that they needed to provide during the last meeting. Um, what, what is it you raise, what is it you asked for that they that they have not addressed races i can't tell you that because i don't have my notes from the last time which documented everything that we have however races the problems i see is races submissions um as far as the local review criteria for both all the marine structures um Pretty much most of it says that it's not applicable because our harbor management plan guidelines only apply to commercial marinas. If you read the entire harbor management plan, there is information in it that pretty much says this is the case. It is for commercial or marine marinas, commercial marinas. However, they apply to all marine structures, regardless of if it's a private or not. So we don't have the local review criteria because, you know, evaluating that against what's proposed. We, the layout and design guidelines, um, it doesn't meet it. The national fire protection information on the electrical, that one says, if their code of 1980, is it four or five? I can't see my writing. Um, within the document, it discusses and makes a statement that whatever code is more stringent, that or the current electrical code, the New York State Building Code, whichever is more stringent needs to be applied. So you have the lighting and the um, boat lift electrical systems, which are not documented on any of the plans that I see. Um, let me see my notes. Mooring standards, um, as you were brought up, that the project uh, doesn't include single port moorings, but a large percentage of most everything in our harbor is on moorings, and those are our standards. Uh, but, but for moorings, this is not a mooring. I understand that. Uh, uh, and in, in addition, I mean, again, a lot of the codes and, and references that are um, mentioned are design guidelines for commercial facilities. This is not a commercial facility. This is a private residential facility. And we did use the codes and standards that would apply to a private residential facility as far as Army Corps of Engineer design standards. Um, and again, uh, I mean, the electrical is gonna be per New York State Building Code. Uh, I believe 2018 uh, is, the, is the latest, greatest New York State Building Code, not something from 1984. Um, we, we apply all of it's the codes my, and, and guidelines where they are applicable to a 
structure of this magnitude. As you are, the point that I'm trying to make is, is this electrical code is specific to marine structures, regardless of whether they're commercial or private. And whichever is more stringent is what these guidelines saying. I've been reviewing marine structures permits for five and a half years. This is the first application in where um, it's different. However, applicants have been amenable to work with us to tell us which code is more stringent, this one or the New York State Building Code, the current building code. But what I also said was there's absolutely no electrical information on the uplands, how you're going to move the electrical wiring and where it's going on the dock and how it's going to be connected. So there's no plan for that. Um, consistency with the water use map and the harbor management plan. Can you tell me which um, map that you looked at for that? Yeah, we looked at the map that was provided by Greg Cutler that I believe has since been posted on the website. Um, it is titled Harbor Management Map, and I believe it has not been updated. In, I'm looking for a year. Greg, do you want to uh, provide any more information on this? There's no year on it. There's no year on it, yeah. Okay, yeah. So if you, you could see our property really isn't even on this. It's, it's at the very, very edge of this. Well, map. I'd like to say this. If you look through the Harbor Management Plan, on page, after page 26. A volume two, uh, right? Yeah, uh, let me, I'll validate that in a minute, but let me just say what I want to say this way. Um, we can move on. Um, there are four maps, which is the harbor management map that we are currently using, okay? One of them is digital in which Greg Cutler provided to you, but there are four maps within the harbor management plan. Um, it does not address all those maps, and uh, it's Harbor Management Plan Part 2. It's Part 2. And most notably, this property is in a critical environmental area. It's, it's in a significant fish and wildlife habitat. Those are marked on those maps, and there's nothing that addresses whether or not um, – you know, things are going to be copacetic or there are going to be impacts. We did provide a statement from our wetlands consultant and that was included in our February and March submissions as well as our September submissions on impacts to the critical environmental area and significant habitat areas. I believe Bill Kenny's on this call. If you have any specific questions for him related to that, those letters and those impacts. Um, that was on the uplands properties. This is more specific to the marine structures. We have no information regards the how the um, seawall or bulkhead, that's what it's termed as in our code, uh, how you're going to do this work without interfering with the Spartina. Uh, also, the floating dock, uh, there is information that um, I don't want to read chapter and verse, but since it's only uh, a certain amount of feet from the actual Bethnic resource, uh, wave action can cause scour just by that float alone, not to mention all the other structures. Um, I'm not talking about vegetation. I'm talking about what lives at the bottom of the seafloor. So yeah. that hasn't been addressed. I can ask a lot of questions, but we really need that to be solidified so we can review and make our determination. We, we, so we've addressed those things during, in our initial response to the 44 LWRP criteria, we do address that. Uh, and Azure can go through it more, so can Bill. I just wanna point out our electrical plans are on our engineering drawings from Hudson Engineering that have been submitted to you. The most revised copy was provided in our May 6th submission. And I'm there, gonna look. Go ahead. Also, with the Army Corps of Engineers permit, there have been several changes to your plan, and their their plan their pr approval says two things. It's subject to other permits and approvals from other agencies, as well as, as if there are any changes to your plan that they have to be resubmitted for review. 
what we require, the normal process of doing an application in this way is unfortunately you went to the Army Corps of Engineers and the DEC and OGS before you came to us. That was the it direction of the okay, village. Doreen, Doreen, I'm Hang gonna, on. Doreen, I'm Hang gonna on. cut it that off because no, There's Doreen, process. I'm go, yes. I'm gonna cut that off because we because we simply can't redo the order in which the application came before us. And if we're going to have a discussion about the the order in which we do these things in a normal course, uh, we can have that discussion, but we're not going to do it on a particular but, applicant where we can't change the history. I let you bat first, but, we have, to, but there are six other commissioners. What uh, I was going to say is, is that the reason why we're here for so long is, is we need to receive whatever submissions were made the application itself our harbor management plan says that okay the application that you submitted to these agencies that's part of the record that we review for a public hearing which we have to do seeker on because we're issuing or not issuing a permit depending on how it works out so the permit application materials for those agencies were all included in our September 13th submission to you and the subsequent amendments and those applications and the permits that were issued subsequently have also been included throughout the various submissions and the records just extensive. Um, and there's a list of all of that on the Harbor Coastal website. Okay. Let's, let's keep this moving. I see David's finger up like he wants to ask a question and I want to hear what you have to ask, David. Okay, I'll be brief. I have just, one of my questions that I raised initially was the ownership issues here because in the research I've done, that's always key, getting permission. I have a lot of trouble with the idea of giving approval to something when the parties in interest uh, is not before us and not making the application. That's like someone getting a permit to do something on my property and it's conditioned, and I find that it's conditioned upon it. That that's it should be a, a beginning step. I'd like to know, understand that. I have a lot of trouble with the condition. The second question, and that deals with the, we've also told that the individual is critical of the project. So why we would go ahead with a project and grant it when we have that condition? I think we're getting ourselves in the middle of a tug of war. The second thing is that I found that there's a letter from, I guess it's a title company, not a title company, it's, a, it's an abstract company or something for First Nationwide, I guess, saying on May 6th that they've examined title and that they're going to give you a certificate of title, which is... Yes, we received that this morning. Okay. That now, was what I was talking about. about with the I had asked about the ownership. I'm, I'm very... One of the key things I was reading the Department of State was saying, the ownership is the whole key here. You, you, you can't just give people permission to do things where you might like to have the right to do it. So you have to get the rights, I think, from the, uh, from the one person that you know about. And I don't know what this says and why this, it would seem to me that why was, what's changed in the ownership issue here? What's changed in the description of the property, if anything? And yeah, what so is that? That's a, that's a great question. And actually, um, Commissioner Newfeld, that was prompted by your comment um, about five months ago in December. Um, during my last appearance, which is, which is why we went through, we reviewed the chain of title and we did find a 1932 boundary line agreement. And that gave us um, reason to go back to First Nationwide title and go back to the surveyor. And the survey was, the survey, um, was subsequently amended to include our rights. So we do have ownership over the gazebo. Now the, the thing that's outstanding is the ownership um, the DEC says we need the authorization for the kayak dock. So that is the one thing we're asking here that you condition your, your approval on is us getting the consent of that underlying property owner for the kayak dock. There really isn't an, an ownership issue for anything else that we're, well, we're the question, for there, there obviously is, forgive me, but there, I think there is because of what you've written or what you handed in. It says that they've now gotten the new examination and they're going to be giving some kind of a certificate of title. I don't know. Right, because they didn't take into account that boundary line agreement initially, which is what we found. The surveyor found it. Yeah, I understand. But where does that boundary line agreement and how does that juxtapose and compare to the other agreement that you need from someone else? So you, they're two different things, aren't they? 
They're, the, yeah, they're two your, completely does your different title, things. Does your property lines change because of what you call the boundary line agreement? Or is it simply an agreement to use someone else's property? Did it change title? Did it vest the title differently? In other words, I can have a neighborhood, I don't want to be unclear here. If my neighbor and I have a, some land, we could agree on it. It doesn't change ownership necessarily, or it could change ownership. I don't know. I don't understand. You're kind of conflating the two, and I'm not clear. It may be me, and I forgive Sorry, me. Sorry, I, 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 I want to just understand something. Are you talking about the gazebo or the dock off the gazebo, or what are you talking about, David? I'm talking about... Your certificate, you wrote a letter, you're, you're, you submitted a letter May 6, 2020. The letter says, we've been advised from your field examiner that your title examination is now, uh, should be returned to the office this afternoon and they're gonna give you something. So that obviously had to change whatever was there before. Maybe it wasn't. I, I would assume that when you bought the property, you had some type of a certificate of title, some kind of a title ownership, be it the deed and otherwise. And I'm assuming it's not an insurable title, but it's one that's vested title. So my question to you then is, what did that result in? And I'm told that you have it, but which doesn't really afford me an opportunity to look at it. It resulted in, in confirming what the survey says, the May 6th survey we provided to you. And that's a separate issue from the- Are you you're representing that it says you are the clear owner and title to what's in that survey? We have a professional signed and sealed survey that the surveyor is representing what's on the survey. I, I'm not a surveyor. Only drawing a excuse me. Surveyors only draw under their standards a description. They don't decide title issues. They just tell you, you tell them go 90 degrees northwest, that's what they'll do. So what I'm saying to you is you obviously gave the surveyor something, which is what was referenced in your May 6, 2020 letter. And that's a new type of some, what you call a, what is called in that, a certificate of title. And you've, you're privy to that. And for reasons that you know best, we haven't received that. Well, I just got it today. That's why you haven't I received understand. it. I, I can submit it to you. I, we don't have a problem giving you that, but I mean, we, we just got it today. So. I, I have a, a, a query about the ownership, right? To me, that's, that's crucial. I think that, uh, from my standpoint only, it, it seems to me that when a public body is asked to issue a, a, some kind of a permit regarding properties, and we don't know what it is, if we see that it's, the survey has been changed and the certificate of title has come up, I don't know what it is. I haven't seen it. I do know that there's, and, and you have another one where you need permission from somebody, and they're a critic. I mean, I don't want to thrust myself in the middle of that. Yeah, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The, the, crit, the criticism is because he doesn't like the, the noise of the flaps that hold oh, down the lumber. The criticism, Gross, let me just finish. I, with all respect, yeah. Mr. Gross, I would yeah. assume that that criticism effectuates and evidences itself by his or her failure to give you a consent. No, I haven't oh, asked for oh, consent yet. You haven't asked no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I have not asked for the consent yet, and I'll tell you why. Because on a, on a literally, I want to be... Let me just tell you what it's like to try and do this thing. You're trying to do a project. You're months and months and months into it. You've done everything you can with every agency you possibly can. And sometimes, Mr. Newfeld, as you know this in life, you know there's a spectrum of, uh, of reactions in life. Sometimes some people just are against anything. And sometimes you have one. I mean, I have a whole street of people who are unbelievably enthusiastic about this house getting up there and helping that neighborhood. I've got one gentleman across a pond who literally anytime he hears a nail go in has an issue. So when you're me, so let me just finish. Let me, when you're me, you think to yourself, what's the most best time to have a discussion with somebody who doesn't like hearing a nail go in when you're trying to rebuild a home, you're gonna wait. And so that's why in my view, uh, again, I'm not gonna do anything to do with a doc. He, he, but Commissioner Maggio said something fascinating. He said for at least from, and I'm, uh, 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 Commissioner Maggio, you correct me if I'm misstating what you said. He thought for you to opine that, that your, issue, your criteria are different from the DEC as long as my thing doesn't, uh, any dock doesn't touch the water. I've clearly got to still get the DEC on board. There's no dock that's going to go in there. What I'm saying is if you want me to do that gazebo, I want a, a conditional agreement from, uh, uh, from, from, from this uh, uh, commission that lets me uh, we'll rebuild that gazebo in kind 
and I will not put a doc on there because I'm not allowed to until I fulfill the condition of the DEC by getting his permission. I'm not doing that at a time when I've got a hostile guy who's upset every time he hears the flapping of a tarp. And it's that simple. There's nothing complicated to it. And, and well, for the love of God, I, I'm, I'm sitting there trying to do this property. And at some point, you got to just trust somebody that they, that they do the right thing. I'm not, I, I'm not allowed to build a dock or put a dock there under the DEC until I get his permission. And so I won't. That's their criteria. Well, Mr. Bose, just to be fair to you, I'm not sure yeah. it's only the DEC because I might find myself on that side as well. And that's situation. fine. Oh, well, I appreciate that's it. That's fine. Well, no, 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 I'm, I'm not, I'm not what trying I'm to What I'm saying to you is that you talk about everybody agreeing and people in favor, and you've done a lot of effort, you've put a lot into this, and there's no question about it. And it's yeah. a, an un massive undertaking, and, it, and I hope will be a, effectuate into a fantastic project. But it doesn't matter how many people are in favor, it really matters the identity of the one who is against it. The one is against it is the one that holds, if you will, the key by owning the underwater property, that I think is is, and, and that's fine. And let me and let me, and let me, and let me just let me give something back that, that I want you just to just to just to reflect on g gently here, which is the following: If you don't give me that conditional approval, I'm not rebuilding that 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 gazebo. I'm literally going to just w w w w there's no way I'm going to go put fifty five to a hundred thousand bucks in if I don't get that agreement because I'm not going to do it. All right. So so that's fine. But do you understand from my standpoint at least that that the way it works is it's, it's, it's what comes first and it becomes first is, okay, I want to do this on this and this property and these are the people with permission. If they haven't given permission and you don't getting along, forget about but, 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 but you're, you're missing what's in it for you. Wait, let me just finish. If yeah. you give me the conditional approval, the, 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 just listen for a second. The doc doesn't go in without his permission, but the, the village of Amerinek gets me to redo that gazebo. You, you and, that, and, that, and, that, and so and so if you don't want me to redo that gazebo which i was doing as a favor i won't redo the gazebo the gazebo doesn't get rebuilt you want a historic restoration of a gazebo i'll give it to you i'm asking for a conditional approval and and, and clearly you're that doc's not going to go in without his approval but if you don't do it i'm not going to rebuild that gazebo i want to i want to try to keep this moving david david i i think uh, that that is a useful exploration of the of the underwater land uh ownership issue i speaking for myself i understand that issue now um you know well enough that i that i can cast vote as a responsible commissioner I would uh, also, do you have yeah do you I have, have anything else yeah one more i'd like to know I, I'm still baffled by this certificate of title what type where does it affect what what is on it what property this motel property? does does the does the title issue affect anything except the underwater lands for the for the uh, g the kayak launch off the gazebo? The certificate of title impacts that property that side of the property the the western property line. So it doesn't specifically talk about just where we want to put the gazebo because it references an agreement that goes back to referencing the entire version of the property line. And that's, that's reflected on the survey. I'm just confused as to. Well, what's going on, you, what will be on it? Is that where the dock is supposed to be? What, what exactly is supposed to be on the property since I don't have the benefit of what Right, so, so, okay, so it goes around the gazebo. That's what it is. It's literally around the gazebo. Yeah. It's the, the area the, the property the line. Yeah, Peter's right. The property line kind of split right through the gazebo. So the, the 1932 document amended it to go around the gazebo because that structure was already in place. Mr. Chair, I would ask for a submission of that, of the whatever they want to refer to it as. Is that different from the type? Does that vary from the um, deed description that you got? The deed description references a uh, prior deed description, so it depends on how you, uh, it, it, not necessarily, no. I'm, have, I'm having trouble now understanding what's at stake with the, with the 32 boundary, with the 32 Please, agreement. What, what changes, depending on whether the original, uh, depending on the difference between the original survey or the 32 agreement? The gazebo would be impacted. 
whether the gazebo is within the ownership of this property or not? No, not, not right. whether it's in it. It's 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 it's, it's, it's a, about a, a third of the gazebo yeah. on the outer edge, the 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 western edge of the gazebo, and that's why they did that uh, agreement in the '30s, was to basically right. make it unambiguous that the house owned the gazebo. Now, by the way, just to be clear, one thing about Mr. Krause, he's not making any claim to that gazebo. He, and I've had a conversation with his wife. There's no claim that anyone's making to the gazebo. So, so, so again, I, I, if people want me to redo the gazebo and you want to give me a conditional uh, approval to move forward, I will rebuild it. No one's making claim to that gazebo. Uh, if, if I don't get it, the gazebo stays and I'll go ahead with the project. Can it stays I, can as I, it right. is. Can, 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 can I just a uh, couple quick things? So I, I really want to know, I know we're trying to be polite. I really want to know the identity of the, the complainant is Mr. Kloss. Is that, is that who's complaining? Correct. There's been, just for the record, there's been no official uh, complaint. Yeah. There's been no objection at any of these meetings by that property owner. This is, our client is just representing discussions that he's had with him related to the ongoing construction. So it doesn't relate to this application. I think, I think, I think at the first meeting, oh, this is important. I think yes. at the first meeting, yeah. you, had, you had two neighbors, right? You had Mrs. Tory and you had Mr. Yeah. Claus, Klaus, okay? They, they wanted, yeah. and, I, and I'm the person who wanted to hear from the neighbors because I was sensitive to their concerns. But mm -hmm. both these neighbors have had have notice of what's going on here, and they all have an opportunity. We've been talking about how many times we've been here. They've mm -hmm. all had an opportunity to come here and voice their objection. We haven't heard, and these people are perfectly capable of hiring mm -hmm. lawyers, and coming here and, and, and voicing their objections, if we haven't heard from them and they know about it and they've actually appeared, then then any objection, in my legal opinion, any objection that they might have that's out there is, is, is been waived. Unless they come here and say something and they know about it, they've had notice of this, of what's going on, then, you know, why are we speculating as to how they feel and, and, and what, what's going on with them if, they, if they've not appeared to, to protest. And the second thing is, you know, if this, if this gazebo is one third on someone else's property, Mr. Gross is a sophisticated person. He's got lawyers, he's got professionals working for him. If he's gonna build, if you're gonna build a house, if anyone's gonna build a house on someone else's property, you, you assume the risk of building that house. So, uh, you know, uh, and there's other legal factors involved, but. Uh, you know, we're spending a lot of time on, on these, these, these minor issues. Um, it, you know, it's going to be another, you know, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock meeting. Uh, if if, if, if the, the boat dock, if the, if the boat lift or the, the, the dock or the, the gazebo or the kayak dock are on other people's property, there's a remedy for that, for, for those, uh, for that trespass, trespass. And it's not, it's, it's not, it's not the, it's not the village. It's these private landowners. Right. I so want to keep I this moving. I'd like, to, I'd like to move it along. I, I think that we're just, we're getting bogged down in the weeds, no pun intended. Tony. But Andrew, we're considering, Tony. we're considering a permit which allows for a structure to be attached to Mr. Gross's gazebo that may or may not be uh, legal because when you traverse underwater lands, there needs to be an easement agreement. That's why it's conditional. That's we why got, we're asking for conditional. I think we kind of got that issue. I think we kind of got that issue. Tony. The gazebo, oh. though, is fully on Mr. Gross's property. And, and again, to the title, the updated title search that David is referring to and, and the updated survey that, is, that was included in the May 6th package uh, shows that the gazebo now is fully on his property. Earlier versions of the survey showed that the line was cutting through the gazebo. It was brought into question and we've since identified and, and found the proper paperwork that shows that the, the gazebo is fully on Mr. Gross's property. So I think- If you make that representation, so, then that, that's what I'm gonna go with. And, and if it's, it's the wrong, surveys in your packet. Yep. And, and if it's if it's wrong, it it's you know you're you're going to have a trespass uh, uh, claim. That's all. Tony, you or, had a question. All right. So another thing. Yeah. Doreen, the, Tony's got a question. Mr. Chair, this question is directed to you. On the policy twenty three is the historic preservation policy that we have. 
And so in reference to the gazebo, it seems to me that that is a historic structure and it should fall under the guidelines of that policy 23. And so I think whatever gets done to that gazebo, we, we would need, I mean, what we have asked for in the past was letters from you know, SHPO or the National uh, Register of Places that it is either eligible for preservation or not. If it is, then there's a set of guidelines that go along with that. So I'd just like to say that. The other question I have is that on either the wall, the, the, uh, the dock or the float or the boat lift and or the gazebo, the, I'm concerned about the lighting and do we have a lighting plan? Yes, yes, that, that was addressed. That, that's and, in the erased memo. All right, and, and what standards are we gonna be trying to, to? No lights, there's no lights on the boat lift or the dock. All right, and none on the wall? I, I, I didn't, I don't know anything about at the wall, but May, the May 6th race memo talks about lighting. There's a specific line item, because I asked about that at the last meeting. Confirm lighting details of boat dock and pier. The boat lift and floating dock will not have lights. The posts on the guardrails on the pier will have low level lighting. A sample of the light fixture is below. Specifications for the lights are included as an attachment. It's a down, down light. Um, it's like a half moon. Down. Yeah, it's like a half moon down light. Yeah, Tony, th thank you for the share about question, which I'm gonna circle back to, but I, but I wanna round out the rest of this. Martin? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, 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 uh, I think we're getting caught in the weeds here too. I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, um, definitely something that I think we, we could consider conditionally, but I haven't been on this committee long enough to know if that's something that's done, but, um, uh, that's my two cents about it for so far. Are we going to be talking, talking about the, we've only been talking about the kayak Doc, are we going to be talking about the other doc as well, or is, is it? Yeah, we have to. We have to. <clears throat> well, we're going to, we we have to consider that. Would if 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 we've got questions, that everything that needs a marine structures permit is up in front of us right now. That's the the kayak launch off of the gazebo, the seawall, the dock, and all the pertinent structures, including the floating dock and the boat lift. Okay, then I, I have a question about the boat dock and the boat lift. And the, um, it, the specifications previously said that there is, is not going to be a railing or anything like that. And looking at the plans, it looks like it's going to be pretty high off the, off the ground and off the water. So my question is, uh, is a railing required for safety uh, reasons or not? Because somebody could fall right off the edge of the dock. Right. Uh, it's, it's not required by code. Uh, and, you know, per the what we thought were the kind of the recommendations coming from some of the commissioners here that they would prefer to see less structure uh, than more structure. So we opted for the no the no railings and, and you'll see from them. The information that I've supplied from the manufacturer, there are um, more boat lifts without guardrails than than those with. Uh, so um, uh, but but I would just say this, Azure, Commissioner Hain, a very good question. For what it's worth, I would have loved to put a rail in. The only reason for safety, I would have loved to put a rail in. The only reason why I wasn't doing it is I was trying to get through the commission and <laughs> I heard that people didn't want a rail in. But, but I, yes, 100% for safety, I would much rather have railings. To, anyway. totally, I totally understand because yeah. I, think, I, I remember the last conversation was around the visual part of, of it. Uh, I just, you know, with the new submission and looking at the height, it was just a question that came to mind whether or not it was a safety issue rather than an aesthetic issue. Well, the, the whole boat lift is a safety issue, right? Anytime you suspend 8,000 pounds, 10 feet in the air, you know, it's going to be a safety issue. There's a pinch hazard. This thing's going to go up and down. It has hydraulics. I mean, it's a dangerous piece of equipment if you don't know what you're doing. Good so, point, Good point. Uh, I mean, either, either which way, you know, boating is dangerous. Um, uh, suspended heavy uh, equipment is, is dangerous. So, you know, uh, there's a, there is an element of danger here, but again, it's, uh, you know, people have the right to have these things. And uh, if you're not paying attention uh, when you're driving your car, you can get into trouble. So, 
you know, just pay attention. And uh, the aesthetics were the uh, aesthetics were, were the concern. While we're on the boat lift, can I just make a couple observations? Uh, yeah, first, go ahead. Of all, first of all, the the this May sixth memo by Race, I think, is very good. I think you must have gone back and reviewed the tape and 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 answered, you know, issue by issue, uh, which is very good. Um, I just have uh, uh, two observations on this. And also, I'd like to say, as a, as a lesson learned for the commission, we asked for alternatives. We went from this uh, boat lift, where it was an unsightly boat lift hanging off pilings, to this, low, this no profile um, device, which, which is, which is uh, tremendously better, tremendously different. I know, I know, I researched this, I went to the website, and I know that there's significantly more costly by a multiple. So uh, I appreciate you guys doing that. Um, just two things. There's a picture of a, and the, and the nice thing about the no profile, and which really changed uh, opinions on this, was that the pilings are underneath the platform, right? That's why it's called no profile. Um, there's a picture of a Greenwich boat lift where I, I, think the, I think the dock is actually improperly installed because the pilings look like they're about six feet proud of the platform. On your plans, uh, they're, they're not that high, but I just want to confirm that the pilings are going to be underneath the platform. You're just going to have a flat surface on the top. Is that correct? That, that's correct. In the picture from Greenwich, the pilings that are shown proud of the boat lift are actually the anchor piles for the adjacent floating dock at that property. So similar to the configuration that we're asking for here, where you have a pier down to a floating dock with the boat lift next to it. So, so those piles that you're seeing are not associated with the boat lift itself, but with the, the, uh, okay. with the dock, floating okay. dock. Well, that, I'm glad you clarified that. Not the best picture in the world to use. The 10K <laughs> open pile boat lift picture is much more appropriate, right? With the cigarette boat on it and the man standing next to it. That, that's the look we're going to have. We're going to have the pilings underneath, right? No railings. Correct. Yeah. No, I just want, I wanted to show some real, again, there's a lot of manufacturer um, photos, but I wanted to show uh, the commission, you know, the, the, you know, these real life examples that are, you know, in, in towns just next door. Yeah, but, certainly. Uh, I appreciate, even, I definitely appreciate that because I think it definitely uh, allowed me to see much more what it's going to look like as a finished product. Now, e even Azure, on the plan, you... hold on, let me finish Azure... what I'm saying here. Hold on, Doreen. Oh. Uh, Azure, yeah, I'm sorry. As you're on, on, your, on your actual plan, though, it does show the pilings proud of the lift, maybe not six feet, but it, it looks like they're proud. Is that how it's going to be built, or, or the pilings will be underneath the actual platform? Uh, let me just take a peek at my plan here. Uh, I mean, the piles again, the piles that support the boat lift would be underneath, as shown in the photos and from the manufacturer. Um, okay, so, so the plan then, is incorrect, right? So I think it's a cleaner look, it's, it's a better look, uh, you know, and I think it's the manufacturer's look to have the pilings underneath the boat lifts, as in that picture, no profile boat lifts, 10K with the cigarette and the man standing next to it. On, on what page is this? Yeah, um, I'm not sure what figure you're, uh, uh, well, we just show that, we just show that they're, it's just like a, like a, a foot above, but that's not really, that's just, uh, it's kind right, of schematic. You, as long as you understand, page seven is, is, is my understanding of how this thing's supposed to be built, with, with the pilings underneath. And the second observation is also on your plan, the, the pilings with the cones on the top for the floating dock mm -hmm. are significantly higher than, than the pilings for the boat lift. Do they have to be that high? Can those come down? So it's, again, more of a no profile look for the boat lift and for the floating dock? We can perhaps lower them a little bit, but they, they should be higher than the no profile lift. Uh, the, the, the way the anchor piles typically get um, designed is for the FEMA base flood plus some, the freeboard of the floating dock such that the float doesn't float off the piles during a significant storm event. Okay, I, I would just say if they, if, if they could come down 
I think that would make a cleaner look and, and make the neighbors happier. Okay, Commissioner O'Rourke has been uh, pretty darn patient. Yep, um, I have uh, two things. One, uh, something to clear the record up on, I think. Um, Commissioner Roney, I think you mentioned early on, just kind of in passing, that there had been pilings or something new kind of added in. I just wanted to confirm clearly that that hasn't happened, um, at least in you know some months going back to what we've been reviewing. Uh, actually, the, yeah, this is Azure, and I did I did want to um, address um, that comment early on in the meeting. Um, be because now we have identified this specific no profile lift um, for this specific boat that uh, Mr. Gross would like to have, uh, that lift does require six pilings. Um, when we were, you know, talking in generalities uh, early on in the process and had not necessarily um, picked a specific lift or you know we were looking at uh, you know other options um, those um, other options were four pile lifts this specific lift from the manufacturer requires six piles uh, so that is that is a change um, that um, is reflected in this May 6th um, submission uh, and again specific to that particular model that we've been asked to, to choose at this time okay, okay. now uh, I'm oh were, were you done Seamus? I had another item unrelated. I figured there might be more there, but I, one more quick, just uh, a comment uh, for consideration. If we consider a um, contingent approval on the kayak dock, um, uh, I'd like to get the email on the record where DEC says that it's um, nothing but that approval that um, is outstanding. Uh, and I'd like to um, make that contingency very narrow. The reason why is just from a precedent perspective, I think we often tell applicants that until they have their DEC permit, we don't know if the DEC is gonna identify something else that we haven't thought about considering. Um, so I would want that to be very narrowly worded. And that's all I have. Okay, I said that I would circle back to one thing, which was the SHPO aspect. I, I have been operating under the assumption that uh, that is, uh, uh, an, an eligible that the gazebo is an eligible structure the, the entire the house of course uh, is a historically significant building I've been operating under the assumption that the gazebo also is is an eligible uh, historically significant structure uh, I think this is probably a question for Mr. Granberg uh, would I be correct and, and I, I may have asked this would I be correct to say that the plan is to do a historic restoration of the gazebo and a rep and an in place in kind restoration of the roof with the only historic differences being the replacement of the unserviceable wood pot the change in floor height due to the change in floor height due to uh water depth and the um and the uh, kayak launch, if there's permission granted for that. Someone has got to mute that phone. I, I figured out who it was. He's he's muted. Thank you. Uh, so I think that was a question for Mr. Granberg. Yes, I, I don't know what. Who's phone it is? It's actually Mr. Granberg, yeah. I read Granberg's phone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right, finally. Uh, I'd ask you to repeat the question, but basically what we're, we're doing is we're, we're replacing the structure in kind. Let's assume you have a site plan that says there's a gazebo on it. I was going to address this before. We're not changing the nature of the gazebo, the meets and bounds of the gazebo, the profile of the gazebo. It's as per the site plan. So theoretically, like on the main house, if we had to go and get a repair permit or an amendment to the main permit, we would go and do whatever appropriate drawings would be needed to repair in kind what was there before. I believe that if we made any drastic changes to that, it might be some review. But at this point in time, we're just sta structurally stabilizing the existing structure that's there. I don't know um, that. Ms. Mr. Chairman, just to dovetail off of what Ira explained, um, we did 
if if the structure were eligible to be listed, that would mean we'd have to comply with the National Park Service guidelines, uh, which we provided to you in our December 4th submission. And Mr. Gramberg has since submitted two memoranda explaining how we do comply with that the Park Service guidelines. So we would submit that, yes. Uh, any any work to the gazebo would be in accordance with that. And thank you for that, Ms. Motel. Can can you just identify for me where in the record you submitted yeah. the the um, the explanation of the National Parks Guideline that specifically relate to the gazebo? Yes, uh, December fourth, two thousand nineteen, uh, supplemental materials and the the applicable criteria from the Park Service is in that submission as well as Mr. Gramberg's memoranda. All right. So what, what that memoranda explains is that e even if it were a listed building, uh, what you're doing to the gazebo is consistent with the correct. applicable National Park Service guidelines? Yes, that's correct. Okay. I, I have the answer to my question that I needed to ask. Um, I think we have, we have, as far as I know, we've exhausted everybody's need for information in order to, to make, a, make a vote on this. Um, I have two more questions, Thomas. All right, ask them. One of them is on the on the survey and the drawings for um, the docking facilities to the east of the um, property. There is an easement outlined. I'm unclear as to who the ownership of the easement between that existing dock potentially on the next door neighbor's property or not. That's what I'm trying to uh, find out. Whose docking facility is just next door on the east of this property? It's Two Shore Road. Two Shore Road. It's Two Shore Road because there's an there's an easement outlined on the um, drawings. Yeah, and let me so, tell you what. Yeah, and and so let me just first of all make something. So Two Shore Road did a full evaluation of the proposed dock. Two Shore Road hired a consultant. Two Shore Road's consultant agreed to the dock that we were doing after having some questions about it. That should be in the record, which I'm sure Azure someone could point to. Historically, we believe, just so you know, the dock at Two Shore Road used to be the dock of One Shore Road. So what originally we believe was the case is that they had the ability to use the dock at One Shore Road at some point, we don't know when, the dock then became owned by Two Shore Road, and that's the whole reason why I needed to put in a dock. But, but just to be very clear, because it's in the record, Two Shore Road fully reviewed the, 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 the application that went to the DEC for uh, the dock at One Shore Road. They hired an expert, the expert reviewed it, and the expert, and it's in our record, the expert said that the owner of Two Shore Road was very comfortable going ahead with the dock. But my question was, is uh, the easement, who, who, whose property is it on the land? Whose property is it and whose easement is it? I don't, I don't understand the relevance of the question. Yeah, neither do I. Neither do I. If, if, if one shore road encroaches on the easement that two shore road has, two shore road will sue one shore road. And, and, and how does that affect us? How, how does it affect us, Lorraine? Because it goes out to the underwater land but, grant. But, but, but we don't have a duty. We don't have a duty to investigate these easements. There's professionals and there's, here. There's, a, there's it actually, it actually does not go, it does not go to the land grant. It does not go to the underwater land grant. It, it actually Thank does you. not. Okay. It does not go Thank to the you. underwater land grant. Okay. Not even that side of the It's on the upper Okay. And I, the second thing is I'd like Azure and Mr. Kenny to provide information as to the effects of the float, the um, boat lift, the kayak docks, shading, and other impacts to benthic resources, being that it's about two and a half feet um, at the surface of the water, and when those are constructed, um, what kind of environmental problems or better conditions can be uh, achieved? 
Uh, this is Azure. I, I mean, I believe a lot of these things were already discussed in previous meetings and submissions, and your village's own consultant, Sven Hoger, had uh, issued two memos to the village uh, that indicated that there were no environmental uh, impacts uh, associated with the proposal. It uh, said that it found a NOAA publication that relates exactly to your proposal. I'm not going to read it all, but due to the fact that um, there's low water there and there's a float there, there's a lot of scour that will happen. Shading does not allow the resources um, that live underneath it to thrive. It's sort of like putting a plant that needs light outside of light. And uh, it creates changes in the environment. Also, um, docking facilities have the potential to attract birds. So that changes it also. I can read from a NOAA publication, which is a federal publication, all of the impacts that that has on um, the Bensnick environment. And that's part of what we address with the LWRP policies, which hasn't been discussed or entertained at all with both docking facilities as well as the Spartina on the seawall. There's nothing in the record that specifically addresses the shading of the gangway, the pier, the docking facility, and the boat lift, nor the kayak dock. In terms of the scour, on the plan, there's stops on the piling so that the boat lift and the, and the floating dock cannot go down below two and a half feet. Correct. And that, and that is per recommendation of DEC, NOAA, and Army Corps, who have, you know, again, per your own um, research there has, I mean, these, those are the guidelines they had come up with for docks in shallow water so that those impacts re re related to benthic uh, habitat impact and shading and so forth are reduced or eliminated. So is, we, we uh, followed their guidelines. Is, I'm going to... Out, I'm going to point out information that I'm aware of. After okay. construction, the presence of docks causes physical and other changes to the marine environment. Tidal and wind-driven currents and waves scow the sediment from around pilings, resulting in physical changes to the substrate that limit vegetative growth around pilings. Physical presence of docks over intertidal and open water areas reduce primary productivity in the area under and adjacent to the docking facility as a result of shading. Shading also results in itoliation, causing stress and resulting in the decreased numbers of aquatic plants, their productivity, and productivity of other species. Sediments under floats in two and a half feet or less of water are often suspended through the winnowing of those sediments, resulting from changes in water pressure under the floats caused by the motion of floats as they move up and down with the move, movement of water by waves. These effects limit and in some cases prevent new vegetative growth under the adjacent pile and supported catwalks and floats in and over the water. In very shallow areas such as these where the floats touch the substrate in very low water, floats crush and destroy organisms. We already know that. Um, I'll jump to, this could lead to introduction of undesired organisms and undesired changes in ecosystem. When propeller-driven vessels use docks and the propeller is within a foot or two feet of the substrate, the propeller washes, wash drives sediments from the substrate, creating furrows and plumes of sediments in the water column behind the path of the vessel. When you have sediments moving like that, it destroys organisms. And that's what we're about to look at in approval because of the problem with the area being too low water, which doesn't meet the Harbor Management Plan guidelines that are put in our harbor management plan by that 
reference document that purportedly Ms. You know, Azure says doesn't apply um, pretty much does. Okay. Uh, I, I do have one follow-up question, and I think it's a question for Azure. Has the, has the area of shading uh, changed from when, uh, from the design as it existed at the time Sven Hoger did his uh, last report, or notwithstanding the, the change in the design of the boat lift, is it still the same area of shading uh, that it was when uh, Mr. Hoger uh, opined? Uh, the area of shading, the, the boat lift is, is a, obviously now a specified make and model, which um, may not have been um, exactly what Sven had envisioned when he wrote his memo. Uh, but I don't think that the shading impact of the final specified boat lift is, uh, again, any different when it's, when it's not, you know, again, nine feet in the air, um, that it's causing any additional shading. Uh, than what would have otherwise been uh, uh, proposed. Okay, uh, I think I have the information I need. Um, it's a lot easier to do the straw poll process when we're uh, when we're all sitting there than when we're looking at screens. Uh, so I'm just going to call a vote at this time. Um, I I do want to get a sense of uh, I I do want to get a sense of the commissioners on conditions because uh, we have tried to keep our conditional approvals. Uh, narrow and verifiable. Here, I think where my sense of it, speaking only as one of seven, is that the, the condition that the DEC requires uh, is pretty well self-enforcing. If uh, they can't get permission to use the underwater land, the DEC is not going to issue a permit, and therefore the condition won't be met, and we don't have to worry that that's going to be evaded in some way, but that's just me talking. Uh, Does that mean that you would Mr. Chair, if I could just ask you, does that mean that your condition would be that it's subject to a DEC permit? Well, it it's, is. <laughs> it's automatically subject to a DEC, DEC permit. They can't build it without the DEC permit. So I, I think our permit, um, I, I, but I think our permit can be conditioned on the approval of the underwater landowner. And that gets enforced anyway, because they don't get their DEC permit if they can't get the approval of the underwater landowner. Yeah, and all of your um, resolutions, I believe, have boilerplate language that say that any other requirements, any other permits must be um, uh, gotten before they move forward. Right, and they, would have to, and they would have to provide that approval in writing to get the DEC in the ordinary course. Is that fair to say, Greg? That's correct. Yeah, okay. Martin? So uh, from what you just said, Chairman Berg, uh, does our approval or dis, yeah, does our approval even need to have conditions if it's already stipulated that if they don't get the DEC permit that they can't build it? So why would, we, why would we even need to create conditions? I'd, I'd like it to have the condition because I think I'd like it to say um, contingent on getting the DEC permit um, with the, um, with getting- But that's already understood. That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's stock in our resolution language. No, but I think that this, I'll go, I agree with the uh, Seamus that if, if you're going to have, it's not, a, it doesn't have to be a boilerplate. This is more specific. This isn't just a generic boilerplate. I think it should say subject to a DEC permit and subject to the permission of the owner. I don't see how it hurts. And I think we shouldn't mess around. Let's not, that's my view. What, okay. what I'm solving for is just that some other thing changes. It doesn't come back to us, right. but the DEC permit is if, I, 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 if, be, to be consistent with the way that I think we've uh, fairly consistently treated applicants. I'd like the it to be just subject to getting the DEC permit, subject to um, the consent of the neighbor, however we word that, and no other changes, something like that. I agree with no other changes, and I, I, I see your point, James. Okay, so I think uh, I'm going to make a motion. Uh, go, go ahead, David. Just one question. Does anyone else have an issue? I have an issue with regard to the lift. Um, I don't view docks and mooring as being the equivalent of lifts. I think they're separate. I think that um, they're not, I, I don't conflate them into one. I'm concerned about the precedent of it because I think everyone can have a lift then. 
And I think that that's not from a visual and from a aesthetic and from a environmental issue that concerns me. Uh, this is a, a boat that there are many, many people who have boats like this, <clears throat> like they propose. And I think that it's much more commercial. It's, it's not residential. I, uh, I don't even think, I have a question as to the code, if the code even allows it. But uh, I don't, uh, I have a problem with the lift uh, under the consistency. I don't David, just to clarify, because there's been some misinformation, there is one existing boat lift right. in, in, the, in the harbor, in, in the Mariner right. Harbor. That's right. And I think that's a very good point. There is one, only one. And I don't know if there was it's a on land. I don't know if there was a variance for that or how it came about. But I can assure you of this. I believe, and I verily believe, that if we approve a lift if for residential, I don't know why anyone else would say, hey, that's not a bad idea. I want to do that too. And I think yeah. that changes the entire visual. I think it, it covers everything, electrical, visual, use of the properties. I think that the idea of docks, and I've taken a look at the, the, the plan, the consistency documents, they talk about docks and moorings. I don't see a dock is including a lift. That's a storage facility. That's much more of a storage thing. I would say that if you ask the average person about a dock or to draw a picture of a dock, they wouldn't assume it's a lift. And the fact that there's yeah. only one on the But there's, there's implications though. I mean, boat lifts are a relatively new phenomenon. They, they do uh, deal with the storage and, and the, the securing of a, of a boat. Right. Uh, just, just because it doesn't specifically say boat lifts, I, I don't think that's exclusive. exclusive. Uh, when you say automobile, do you mean coupe? Do you mean four door? Do you mean SUV? I mean, it's a it's a broad term. I, I see. Now if I have a garage, if I have a, if as I have anything a, as anything that 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 could that could store or house or or more uh, a vessel. That that that's my interpretation of it. So well, Andrew, if Tony, have, if hang on a second. Tony's really trying to get a word in edgewise here. <clears throat> so I agree with David, right? That from the beginning of this application, the first letter we wrote to DEC basically said that we don't have to approve any of that water use, that all we had to approve was to ask the applicant to get a mooring from the village and give them a, a duck walk. And so to go all the way down to start a lift, to me, is way out of character for the village of Mamaronek. So I agree 100% with David. Can, can I just clarify, because... This is important, and I've been recently edified after a two and a half phone call, two and a half hour phone call with Steve Ressler, who's the person that's responsible for, for training us. And I discussed a, a variety of things. And, and Mr. Ressler pointed out, unlike Larchmont Harbor or Milton Harbor and Rye or Hempstead Harbor, the LWRP of the village of Amaranek gives the waterfront homeowner a right. It's very clear. You have a right to adopt. In the village of Amaranek. And, and further, the, the LWRP uh, promotes recreational boating. This isn't a lobster boat. This isn't a commercial fishery. This is a, a private pleasure boat. So I, I, think, I think the applicant has rights here that um, maybe we're not all well versed in, but uh, according to Mr. Ressler, this is the person who's worked for the Department of State that, that's our trainer or, and who was going to be our trainer if it hadn't been for the pandemic, you know, told me that it's very unique to Mamaroneck. Perhaps it's the only, one of the only harbors in, uh, in the entire Long Island Sound where there is a right to a dock. Tony, it's not, it's not a duck walk. It's not a mooring. It's a right to a dock. So well, I, ju just understand that. that. That's what I've been told. But if you look at the LWRP, it talks about the talk about a place for docking. It's like you use the vehicle. If I have a if I have a driveway, maybe I, I suppose if I adopt the analogy, then then if I have a driveway, I can stack my cars on the driveway. Why not? Keep the whole the whole premise. The whole. Um, forgive me for just interjecting. Right. I never wanted to do a boat lift. The reason why I put went for the boat lift was in my own conversations, not just Azure. I personally invested hours in this thing talking to the dec they wanted the boat lift because it would protect the environment and protect the floor of of the of the of the of long island sound and so it, and it, it's not inconsequential the expense of this thing so i want to use a boat and i'm trying to be responsible for the for the local ecosystem and that was for it the motivation was not 
anything other than to be responsible to the environment. And that's what the DEC said to me. And I never went into it looking for a boat lift. It was purely to be responsible. And that's the idea. And I just want to make, I, I can't, I actually, I would never ever think that somehow the, the, uh, the intellectual perspicacity that, that is demonstrated by a number of, uh, of, of, of the comments that constantly get made in this, on this panel, that somehow this would be a group that would retire and not push back if they thought somebody without great cause ever asked for a boat lift. The only reason for the boat lift is to protect that environment. That's it. The reason being, Mr. Gross, is because you don't have adequate um, adequate uh, water depth, correct? The, 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 re the reason is that even a small boat in that area, the, the DEC was concerned that it would be hitting the bottom of Long Island Sound. So the idea is to, to use the boat lift so to make sure that there's no damage to Long Island Sound I will clearly have certain parts of, of, the, of, the, of the day, uh, depending upon the tides, that I will not use the boat. And my, idea, my whole thought here is to, to live in this house until I die and to be a proper steward of that area. And the boat lift was in furtherance of recreational boating, but doing it responsibly in light of the, the, the dynamics of, of, of the depth of the water at that, pl at that area. That's it. And I would just ask for Under a vote. From, I would just ask for a vote. Understood. From the Understood. And I will live with the boat. Understood. You, you definitely want to be environmentally sensitive. However, that whatever is approved there remains, and we can't count on, you know, 100 years from now when you're no longer here, uh, that it's going to be utilized in the same way that you intend to use it. It's a structure that has its use. As far as another boat lift is concerned in the harbor, it's on land. It's not in the water. And number two, our harbor management plan says that any docking facility that was approved prior to 1986, and I forgot the month and the year, stays. So I'm not 100% correct, and I wish Joe Russo were with us tonight, but it could very well be that boat lift was there prior to 1986. I'm assuming, which I may not be correct, the other one in Mamaroneck. Um, I have a lot of problems with conditioning consistency because when you put words on a page, they're not really um, held to the limit. I did that once. On, I said I would never do it again. I did, did it once on a very recent previous um, application, and um, I will not do it again. I will not condition anything. Mr. Neufeld brings up a very important thing in our LWRP, aesthetics. I forgot which policy it is, but um, view sheds, aesthetics have to be considered into this equation. 25. And view, sh thank you. View sheds to and from Harbor Island. So when you're out on the sound, and the first thing you see within the jurisdiction of the village on your property is what we have there, which is going to be blocking the um, waterfall off of Van Amridge Mill Pond. Um, you know, that's an important consideration for me. And it doesn't seem too consistent with policy 25. Okay, we've, we've all spent a lot of time talking about the marine structures aspects of this thing. I, we may not all agree, but I think we're all clear on what the issues are. Uh, so I'm going to call a vote at this time. And uh, what I'm going to move is that we uh, grant the marine structures permit conditional on the receipt of both a DEC permit and underwater landowner approval for the kayak launch at the site of the gazebo. Do I have a second? Can I interject something, Thomas? According to our code, we have to have a public hearing on this. We did. And it has to be noticed. We did. I we second, noticed. Thomas. We, we noticed and held a public hearing on the marine structures permit. You do have a draft resolution before you. Have we, I believe that we have to close the public hearing. 
unless I'm, I'm mistaken. We closed the public hearing. I Look, my recollection is that we opened, held, and closed a public hearing on the marine structures permit at our last meeting. On April 1st? That is correct. Okay. Uh, Chairman Burt. That was not um, our last meeting, April 1st. Thank you. Chairman Burt, to Seamus's point as well, also that there be no further changes. Oh, thank we. Okay, so motion so amended. Second. Commissioner Hain. Aye. Commissioner O'Rourke. Aye. Commissioner Maggio. Aye. Commissioner uh, Gelber. No. Commissioner Newfeld. No. Commissioner Roney. No. Aye. Um, Chair, I think you also have to do consistency, uh, but I think that's in your resolution. Um, just, just so you know, because there wasn't consistency granted for those portions that um, are uh, seeking a marine structure portion permit. I, I'm guessing we all had the consistency issue in mind. Uh, does Does anyone have a different vote uh, for consistency than they do on the permit? No, I didn't think so. Thank you very much for everybody's time. And I'm sorry that the people who didn't vote for it, I hope that in the future you'll feel good about what we've done at the property because uh, our attentions are really, uh, uh, are, are at least in line with what I think your aspirations are. So I hope the people who voted against this will, will come later to, to feel better about it. Thank you. Chair, if, well, if I can, I, I know it'll be annoying, but if you don't mind, I think we should do a, a formal consistency vote just to make sure that we have both on the record. Move for finding consistency on the marine structures. Do I have a second? Second. Commissioner Hain? Aye. Aye. Commissioner O'Rourke? Aye. Commissioner Maggio? Aye. Newfeld? No. Uh, Gelber? No. Roney? No. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. D did we need Chairman Burt to say if he agreed with consistency? Did he say aye? He did. He did. Oh, actually. thank you so much. Okay, we, terrific. We, thank you. We, we have concluded our business with this application. Thank you very much. We have a... Um, stay safe, folks. We thank have you. a... Um, a new application before us, uh, and there are, it's it's technically on for preliminary consistency, but it, it's uh, we have to. It's not even clear that we're that far along. This may be an incomplete application. We'll have some questions about that. Uh, Eleven sixty-five Grecian Point. Can we take a two-minute break there? Uh, Comfort I... break. Yeah. yeah thank you, thank you for reminding me that all of us need a few minutes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you don't have to take it. <laughs>
Sorry about that. I got disconnected for a moment. Okay, we need to hear from, uh, well, we need to hear from, we need everybody to get back and then we'll hear from Grisha. Did my phone cut out? No. No, we can hear you. We hear you. Disappeared on the screen. <laughs> While we're waiting, I'd like to thank Greg because he took um, a disc that I received on the last consistency training. The appendices were mis missing from the consistency manual, and uh, Greg did a ton of work to get everything back up on our um, web page. So thanks very much, Greg. Yep. I have your disc, too. It's not lost. <laughs> I'll, we'll, we'll have to arrange to get it back. Let's wait until we can go out without masks. Okay. <laughs> Tony. So Chairman Burt, this is kind of a general remark on the LWRP. And basically, the whether something is consistent or not, we as commissioners decide that, right? Our interpretation of that LWRP is what makes something consistent, not consistent, or consistent with conditions. And I think that's a very important point for us all to remember. So that's all I'm going to say. And the consistency manual tells you if it's consistent or not, or how you arrive at that. Right, so I'm glad it's on our, our web page for not only us, but for applicants. I agree, Doreen. That consistency manual is very helpful. But we are the ultimate deciders of the interpretation of the LWRP with the guidance of that consistency manual. Well, the basis of our LWRP is on federal law and state law and local laws implementing our policies. Correct. Do we have everyone? We have each other. <laughs> Frightening. <laughs> yes, we... We have all the commissioners, and it looks like I don't know if I don't know if uh, Greg, Christie, yeah. Betty, and are back. Yes, we have. Where are okay. my glasses? Ah! I have to run and find my glasses. I'll be right back. Okay, we can proceed. Um, applicant for uh, 1165 Grecian. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, commissioners. My name is Rich Cordon with JMC. We are the site engineers for the, pro for the project for Mr. and Mrs. Fadina, who own the property at 1165 Grecian Point Road. Uh, Mr. Fadina is here tonight, and he would like to say a few words to introduce everybody to the project. 
Uh, thank you, Rich. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, I'll just start by saying I know it's late, so thank you for your time. This is, uh, this is my first uh, committee. And uh, I guess just bought the house a little over a year ago. Three young kids were looking to move in, and I hope uh, we're trying to make this uh, as easy from sort of a novice here, but we're not looking for any seawall, any dock that's been there for 70 years, nothing in the wetland proper, all the setbacks and trying to put, keep the house where it is. Um, so I, all I'd say is I, I had the pleasure of meeting Andrew Maggio when I was doing some yard work last Friday. Uh, if anyone wants to go to the house, they can go there anytime on chaperoned. It's vacant. Uh, it's vacant, probably should be condemned. I'd caution you from maybe going in. But um, if not, if you want a chaperone, let me know. I, I find that uh, we can resolve a lot of things in person and I'm willing to be anyone face to face at any time. So uh, sort of with that, I'll turn it back to uh, the expert Rich, but it's just a pleasure and literally thank you for taking the time this late in the evening. And uh, obviously if we uh, don't resolve anything, I would request we uh, just give us any and all comments and we'll try to address any and all for the next meeting. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, so would I be able to share my screen real quick? I have uh, put together a quick PowerPoint. Please do. Okay. Share screen, PowerPoint, share. We'll give you guys a nice little from the beginning. Okay. Um, this is an, uh, this is an architectural rendering of the proposed residence. Um, as you can see, it's two and a half stories. It's going to be just under 35 feet of height, which is going to make sure that we don't need a building variance. The approximate square footage of the building is about 4,800 square feet. Um, it's fairly in uh, context uh, to the housing uh, surrounding houses. Uh, it's a little bit smaller, actually. As you can see, here's an aerial fo uh, aerial map. Um, depicting where our site is on Grecian Point Road. Uh, the actual site frontage over here along Grecian Point Road is, uh, this is along a private road, right over where that starts with the dog leg, the road switch from, switches from being a public road to a private road. Um, as you can see, the site is fairly, um, not as developed as some of the other sites. Um, this is our proposed layout plan where you can see we're kind of basically going to develop the site as is. We're going to construct a house in basically the same location that's it's there now. Um, the existing house is in disrepair. Um, there's mold, there's mildew, it's really not habitable. So what we're looking to do is raise the existing home and construct a new home. Um, like I said, similar footprint, similar area, not much larger. It's going to be a two and a half story instead of the one and a half story. Um, to in order to construct this, it, oh, I'm sorry, here you can see where we have the house depicted. Um, this will give you a little bit more idea of the context of the size of the house compared to some of the other homes in the neighborhood. Uh, it's a little bit more of a modest home. It's not necessarily as much of a reach as some of the other ones. Um, we're trying to stay as far away from the wetland as we possibly can. Um, away from the water for Delancey Cove, away from the wetland proper. Um, unfortunately, due to the nature of the lot, we are unable to stay out of the wetland buffer. Um, over here, this shows our grading and utility plan. What we're proposing for the site is we're proposing to put the septic system in the front lot of the house um, due to the elevation of groundwater, rock, and everything else. This is, kind of, this is the only location where we can um, make a septic system work that's going to be in accordance with all the regulations with the health department and such. Um, unfortunately, we do are going to need to fill slightly on the site. We're going to have to bring in some fill for the septic system. All that fill is going to be a run of bank fill, um, which is more of a sand and gravel. It's well drained. It's going to allow the septic to the, the septic system to work to its best ability and uh, keep everything up in the front. Um, we are going to try to look at regrading the site a little bit to pull back some of the contours out of the wetland buffer setback. Um, here you can see this is what our disturbance is going to be. Um, however, if you take a peek at the site, this is the front view of the home. Um, and here's the rear view. The site has already been fairly disturbed for a number of years. This is all lawn. We're proposing to keep the area as a lawn area. Um, we're not really changing much of anything there. The house, like we said before, is going into the location it's going. We're picking the house up a little bit to comply with the FEMA regulations to be above the floodplain. 
100 um, year floodplain with I believe our 100 year flood elevation there is 14 feet so we're going to put the finished floor slightly above that. Um, here's another view as you could see this is the wetland area in the back of the site it's it is a wetland however it's we're going to pretty much keep that area as is. Um, does anybody have any questions on the application was everybody able to get out to the site? I have not yet made it out to the site. I'm uh, trying to minimize trips out because uh, members of my immediate family have a known uh, COVID exposure. And when we're, when we're sure that I'm not going to get anybody else sick, I will get out to that site. Um, we have, uh, where is the footprint of the existing property uh, in, of, of the existing home in relation to the, uh, to the, to the planned proposed condition? Yeah. I'm getting that over here. Okay, so it's pretty much right on top of it. Um, if uh, I don't know how, can you guys see my mouse pointer? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm outlining the existing home right now, and it's it's. It's, it's actually, on the plan. You can even you know try and zoom in. Okay. You, is like, it con is control it plus? I'm sorry. Is if it you, possible to? in on this yeah how's okay that? there you go okay what is the square footage of the existing property existing improvements uh the existing home is a it looks to be about 2800 to 3000 square feet no what's what's the footprint what's the, what's the footprint size of the existing home um i'm not sure off the top of my head on i'd have to look i'd have to look that up okay is almost the entirety of the proposed construction is within the wetland buffer. Correct. Okay. That's where um, the existing home is, unfortunately. Where is what what's the what's the front setback? Twenty five feet? Yes, the front setback is twenty five feet. In but in order to we have to um in order to make a septic system work on the lot, we need to use that front area. And that's an area where that the existing septic system is. I have a question. Don't you need, I'm sorry. I do have a question about septic. I know there's, we, I don't know if anyone was on the board, but there was a previous application of a neighbor who was going to convert from septic and run a sewer line down that road with other neighbors. I'm not sure if that went forward or not, but um, mm -hmm. I could look it up. I'm not sure if it went forward um, as to doing that sewer line, but I know several neighbors on Grecian Point Road and a property owner that we did an approval with um, did want to try to do that. I believe that, uh, and just an answer to that, I, for what it's worth, somebody came to my door about a week ago and I'm on Grecian Point Road and wanted to use a, um, they were using my property to run a survey line. And I asked why, and they said that because the neighbors down the street uh, were hooking up to the sewer. But um, if I may, I have a question for you on, on this. Um, I, this is, the footprint is not the same as I see it. Don't you need, you need a variance for the driveway as you've drawn it, don't you? I don't believe so. Yeah, I thought there was a five foot setback on all driveways. Five to 10 up the planning board on commercial, go to 10, I believe, or on site they can go to 10, but five is the minimum. I'll look into that. Yeah, we're, <clears throat> we're having the planning, uh, I mean, sorry, the building department look at that again. I, I did notice that as well. So we'll yeah. make sure that. Um, and that may affect you a lot because you need that as a turnaround to turn into the garage there. Because I think you've got about a one and a half foot, two foot. I, I was able to figure it out by your 20. Three. Yeah. It's three feet off of there. Okay. You'll see right. the dimension. It's right about over here. I think the biggest thing I have on your application, candidly, is that I think when one reads it, you, you constantly are referring to or certainly alluding to that this is going to be on the same where the present house is. And the twenty eight hundred to forty eight hundred dollars twenty twenty eight hundred to forty hundred square foot difference is not because you're adding a floor or not. It's because if you compare the two, they're significantly different in size on the footprint, as well as I believe this one comes out more towards the wetlands. But um, 
What, where can you point to? The wetlands are on which side? Because I'm confused by the, the line you have. The wetland is this. I'm sorry. I should, have sh I should have done a different color. But the wetlands are back over here. These are the wetland flags. One, two, three, four, five, six of them over here. And this is the, this is the wetland side. This is where Delancey Cove is. Right. On this side. So your 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 buffer your your orange it's line is where you 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 leave the that's that's the buffer correct? That's correct. You also have delineated on the plan the limit of uh, DEC jurisdiction on the ten foot contour. Yes, ma'am. As this, as 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 um, the wetlands, I know you flagged the wetlands in the field. But has the DEC done a jurisdictional determination on where the wetlands exist and where the buffer is? And, you know, have you done anything with the DEC on this yet? We have. The DEC has been to the site. The DEC has agreed with the wetland consultant with the flagging of the wetlands. Um, currently, they're looking at the wetland application. There's an analyst that's been assigned to the project. And they're still looking at it. I haven't gotten, we haven't gotten any final, um, anything final from them yet. So what is your demarcation on the plan where, which is within the 10 foot contour that says jurisdiction of DEC? What does that mean? Well, okay. So with the DEC, with their um, jurisdiction, it is, their jurisdictional limit would be, um, for example, if there's a seawall on the property on the neighbor here and a seawall on the property the neighbor here and this property line was less than 100 feet, their jurisdiction would end over here. However, if there's not that, then it's either 300 feet, the roadway, or the 10-foot contour. Correct. So, so you don't have the seawall. We don't have the seawall, so we don't have that app. We don't have that jurisdiction. It would be 300 feet, the roadway, or that 10 foot contour. So in discussions with the DEC at this, mo at this time, it's looking like their jurisdictional limit is going to be that 10 foot contour. Yeah. However, they have not completed their analysis. One thing you do in your application is a lot in about three places i think you say you're going to do something to the maximum extent possible and i can speaking right. for myself that's should be minimum that's, a, that's yeah. a, an ambiguous statement of the maximum extent possible you know that means i'll do the best i can do i mean I, and i assume you will do the best you can do but i guess my function as i see it is what are you going to do what do you propose to do and then we can decide when the maximum is or if it meets the criteria. Because to, just to suggest you'll do it the best you can is, doesn't, doesn't give me a, I guess it gives me pause. Yeah, and you do that with um, a few places. Um, what? Okay. Why do you need, you need the front, it's on septic now? Is that the reason it's set back or is that what you That's need? correct. That's correct. It's on septic now and at this current time, um, we're moving forward with an application that's on septic. We don't know if the village is going to uh, take ownership of an existing private sewer line that, that goes down Grecian Point Road. Um, right now, there is no public sewer in Grecian Point Road along there. There's no, along, you, that's right. You, you define that earlier as private, don't you? That's correct. And that the sewer line that is, there's actually five sewer lines that are in, the, are in that road. And right now, they're all private. We don't, we cannot tie into a private line that's not acceptable by the health department. What do you base the fact that you say it's private on? I mean, I, I, I happen to have looked into that myself once on the privacy issue. Those, those lines are all owned by individuals. Um, they were installed. No, no, I'm not talking about the, I'm not talking about the I mean, the, the road itself you said was private earlier. That's correct. The town owns up to a certain portion and then from the portion beyond owned by a homeowners association or a road association i should say yeah i don't think that's accurate but okay yeah okay so, i apologize if i missed this in the in the materials but do you have an environmental consultant yet oh um environmental consultant for what the wetland consultant 
you're building almost the entirety of this proposed project within the hundred foot wetland buffer. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have a wetland consultant that we're dealing with. Okay, because what what we need to know from applicants is whether the building in the whether any work in the buffer zone is going to have any adverse impact on the adjacent wetlands. Okay. So just so that we're completely mm -hmm. transparent about where we're going, mm -hmm. we're going to need to know if there's mm -hmm. any adverse impact to the wetlands at all from mm -hmm. building in the buffer zone. Understood. Understood. I would, I would also like to include in that, Commissioner Bird, the removal of all the trees and what, and what effect that will have on the wetland as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, because can, can they're, 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 removing, they're removing 50 plus trees. Right. Do you, yeah, it's a wooded area now. Do you have, um, how many agencies, who else do you need approvals from or permits from? We're going to need health department approval and we're also going to need the DEC approval. Um, the applicant would like to speak real quick, Greg. Is there any way you can uh, bring uh, yeah. him back on? I, um, I unmuted him, so he should okay. be able to speak. Thank, thank you, Rich. It, it, it's about two minutes past two. I'm sorry, I was trying to raise my hand. Uh, it was just a question on the road status. So the 19 houses around the curve. In 1953, there was a road association, uh, not, not a homeowners association. Mm -hmm. And so the private sewer lines, uh, there are public documents filed in 2006, which five homeowners installed their own private sewer line from Orienta all the way through the end of the street. And uh, uh, Doreen, Commissioner uh, Rooney, pardon me, uh, one of my neighbors mentioned to me, yes, they were investigating, um, trying to take one of them and connect any other homeowner or multiple homeowners to those lines. And to do so, any one additional connection is a public line and that's been a process that's been ongoing. I just want, pardon me for not being able to speak two minutes ago. That's okay. Can I- Well, uh, I figured I'd that out there just in case it would, it might be an option if it were there. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. What's missing from this um, plans, when, what's missing from the plans are, it's obvious you're in a floodplain um, but there's nothing showing uh, the floodplain elevations on any of the plan documents. That needs to happen. And is the house being elevated to two feet above base flood elevation? I know that's not our domain. However, there are flood policies, 12 through 17, that deal with this. And I, I can also comment there, the architect's not on the line. Yes, the ground floor is going to be at 16 BFE. So 13 is the 100 year, or at least two, we're going to go three feet over. I, 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 yeah, I don't see anything on the plan documents. So that's, you know, that needs to get there. That'll be on the also, resubmitted you, documents. You resubmitted it? I'm res I will resubmit, we will resubmit it. We received a comment. Um, memo last week from the cons villages at consulting engineer and we right. will be responding to those comments and that's one of the comments that's one of the things that we will do we will have the floodplain the revised flood the correct flood pit lane lines um, illustrated on the drawings well, then there's, there's another issue with floodplain and wetlands when it comes to fill um, because fill uh, and floodplains and wetlands sort of aren't happy with each other. I will say that um, yeah. in the scope, scheme and scope of things. Mm -hmm. So um, that really needs to be looked at carefully and closely because fill and wetlands or buffers um, really isn't copacetic. We, we have... Um... We have a no net fill rule in floodplains in riverine floodplains. It's absolute, but we have generally called a fairly tight strike zone on um, a net um, positive net fill in any floodplain because it has consequences for everything around it. Uh, you, so you should not be you should not be putting an application in front of us um, that has net positive net fill uh, unless uh, you you have really thought about how you're going to justify that. Understood. Have you filed an application with DEC yet? No, we haven't. Have yeah. you done a joint application? It's called a joint application. Is yes. The DEC, mm -hmm. is I there, know. Do you, you don't have any, uh, do you have an under order land grant at all? 
Uh, I'm sorry, what did you say? A, 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 a what land is there, grant? Is there an underwater land grant attached to this property at all? I don't know. I'll have to look that up. I can look it up too on our study, but it might not be there. Um, I'm mentioning the joint application for a reason. It would be in your best interest to do a joint application with the DEC, mm -hmm. DOS, Army Corps of Engineers, or whatever their method is for jurisdictional determination. Because we have certain regulations that we have to enforce, but they have other regulations that deal with wetlands and the like. So it's better to start from the beginning. Yeah, we, we did ask them to provide that um, when we had our pre-application meeting with them. Yeah. And it would be very helpful for us that whatever you submit to them, the application, not the permit or anything like that, but the information that you need to submit to these agencies, if we have it, it saves a tremendous amount of time and effort on your part. No problem. A question for you on the on the garage. The, the garage, that's the one that's 31, point, uh, 31 feet from the line, correct? Yes, sir. The, yeah. Okay. So I, I assume that's where the entrance is on the side there, right? That's correct. How many car garages is that? It's going to be a uh, three car garage, I believe. So how much distance do you need to make the turn in and out of it? No, it's to back out and... It's going to be tight, but it's going to be it's going to be acceptable. For example, um, it, generally in a parking lot where you have uh, a parking lot in a, in, a, in a shopping center or something, your backing lane is 24 feet. So it, it's going to be a little bit tight, but it's um, well, it's going to be tighter because you don't you're not giving any you're not allowing you're too close to the property line as it is. No, you follow what I'm saying? No, I do. Right. I do. I understand. And you don't have that much room on the other side, so there has to yeah, be. Yeah, my, my, my confusion with this was why the, why the garage was oriented in this way in the first place, because if it was oriented sideways with the driveway going straight to it, it seems like it would make much more sense that way. And the runoff would be more controlled then and not into the buffer. It would be running off back to, towards the street. Right. And you'd can also I give a little be using background on this. Can I, can I just give you a little background for um, since I was out there? Um, the, the the lot is uh, very very low. Um, the the backyard is is um, is very very wet, and it's almost uh, has a bold depression in it, and the surrounding houses are are the the houses the yards are much higher and they've probably probably been filled so most of the water surrounding properties unfortunately runs to this into this backyard in terms of the trees uh it, it's very very heavily wooded to, to build a house that the tree that the house has been neglected for a long long time it's in a very bad state of repair the trees are growing right on and they are significant trees but they're growing right over the house it, it would be impossible to build a new house even on the existing footprint and not have a dangerous situation. Um, I, I was, uh, I, I was at, inquiring about the sewer and the septic system. I was concerned that it, it was so wet that uh, the septic system might not perk. And uh, the, the septic system is gonna be in the front yard where, which appears to be a little bit higher. Uh, the, 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 the sewer lines are from what the homeowner told me are private. So that would preclude any additional hookup. It, it's, it, it's really worth going out there and seeing. It's, uh, the, the lot has some limitations. I think the homeowner's done the best with what he has, um, but there, there are some real significant uh, uh, limitations with the, with the wetland. And, and it should also be noted that the, the buffer zone and the wetland, the wetland is really just a really wet grassy area. There's no vegetation there that indicates wetland it's just a, a, a bold, depressed backyard that, that's very wet, and it's just, it's, it's regular grass, and the grass isn't really growing uh, very well there. So in terms of environmental protection, uh, it, technically it's a wetland, and there is a buffer zone there, but if you, if you went out and saw it, 
it, it wouldn't be a, a wetland um, in the conventional sense of supporting um, amphibians and, uh, and certain vegetation. Andrew, would that would that be because it was it was um, converted to lawn years ago, and that that the, it was previously a natural wetland that has been turned into a yard in previous years? Uh, you know, I remember that area, and, and I uh, thirty years ago, and uh, I remember some of the houses up down there that that were uh, demolished, and I think the whole the, the Grecian Point Road, especially as you go down past that dog leg is very low lying. I'm sure a lot of it was, was wetland, but a significant number of the houses, especially on that side of the, of the road have been built up. If you look immediately to the right and left, the elevation of those yards and those houses are, are significantly higher. Yeah, and, I, and they also have seawalls. So uh, this is the only house really that doesn't have a seawall. Right, and, and, that, that's right. And, I, and I get that. And uh, and that's where my question came with the runoff from the driveway. If that if we're elevating it, the runoff is going to go right into the buffer and the wetland. And so the the driveway itself, if it's if it's situated more towards the street, it would run towards the street rather than off the elevation into the buffer zone and into the wetland. Um, and I, I also have a question about the septic system. Since we are putting in a new septic system and this is so close. This is within the buffer zone and the wetland. Um, uh, are you going to be using a system that also filters out uh, nitrogen? It's okay. We are going to use an advanced treatment system, and the septic system is outside of the wetland buffer, and it's out. It's it's going to be placed up over here, which is away. I, I get that. It's just outside the buffer. I <laughs> got so you know anything that leaches into the soil will eventually make it through the buffer to the wetland. So that's why my, that's why I have the question about the nitrogen. What about what's that circle? What is that that semicircle on the back of the bar? What is that an architectural feature of some type? That's, right here. Yeah, that's part of the building. Yes, because you do have room to move it over. You know, sure. below that as you go face the street. I think one of the things you have to consider is is if if you're not going to change this, I think you'd have to go to zoning before because this is not an approvable plan as of right. Agreed. Well, the other thing is, is um, in the stormwater design manual, chapter three is, is the planning before you decide how you're going to deal with your stormwater. And, uh, you know, the recommendation is to preserve and protect natural resources, which includes wetlands and buffers and other um, resource features. Um, and it's not to be included in the development site proposal. So I don't know how you meet chapter three of the stormwater design manual when it comes to stormwater management planning and looking at the site with the six step process before you even do any um, stormwater ma management facility assessment and all of that. Can you explain that? We are we have an existing site that we want, that we will, we're not trying to overly develop. We're trying to um, build something. Um, so that way the owner has a place to raise his family. Um, it's, it's, those are recommendations. It's not set in stone. What we're planning to do is we are planning to do rainwater harvesting. Um, we were, we're gonna curb the driveway to catch the rainwater and treat it. Um, we're going to do everything that we can in our power to minimize any impact to the wetland consult to the wetland areas as well as the buffers. Where's the so how, but question, My question was, how are you meeting Chapter Three of the Stormwater Design Manual, which is our code, um, with your proposed conceptual plan here? Cause, because what, what chapter three proposes is you look at the site and you avoid wetlands and wetland buffers and forests and all kinds of other things. And it's not to be included in the development portion of the site, as I understand it. 
can I ask what the existing house, when was the existing house built? Existing house was built in 1957. Around. So that means, so that means it's over 50 years old and it could be eligible for landmarking. And so- uh, We already have a letter, Tony. We do? We have a letter yep. from Shipbill. But why don't, so why don't we just restore the existing house? It seems to me you're in a wetlands buffer. It seems to me you got a bunch of trees. It seems to me that this construction is gonna do a lot of environmental damage. So why don't we just, why aren't we just restoring this house, making it a little bigger or something reasonable versus knocking it down and starting all over again? Because in order, because the house is too low, you have to raise it up above the 100 year floodplain elevation. Okay. The two feet above there. You have to have a septic system that's going to work. Right now, the septic system doesn't work. It okay. has to be. Well, you could, you could put a septic system. That does, you don't have to build a new house to put a septic system. You have to raise, you have to raise the front of the, where the existing septic system is about approximately two feet with the runner bank fill to raise that area. So that way you can get a compliant septic system with the Westchester County Department of Health regulations. Well, houses can be raised, though. Without, without tearing them down. That, that's done all the time. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I mean, it, it just <clears throat> seems to me that that the, the damage to the environment from knocking this house down and building a new one, especially if you have to knock down those trees, it's... it's well, even if you're going to, even if you were going to restore that house, you're still going to have to take a number of those trees down. You're going to have to take the trees down in order to repair the septic system. If you're going to do anything with this lot, there's going to be trees that are going to have to come down. And the existing state of that building, it's going to basically have to be completely and utterly gutted in order to turn it into something that's going to be habitable for somebody to raise their family. I think the trees on the marsh side of the house, though, don't necessarily need to be all torn out. I mean, you basically eliminate all of them, but six. And okay. all, all of them along the, along the marsh line that are preventing erosion and all that kind of stuff. So, well, I mean, most well, of the construction is going to be happening from the street side with equipment coming in and out. They're not going to be bringing equipment in through the, in through the marsh side of the house. No. <clears throat> We're going to look at regrading the site and seeing what we can do to save some more of the trees. That'd we'll see great. what we can do to pull like some that. of, minimize all the grading as best we can. I'll, I'll try, we're gonna try to see if we can, and I think I can, I think I have a grading plan that's gonna work where we'll minimize all the grading and um, any type of a fill that's past that wetland buffer. Uh, anything behind that wetland buffer, we'll, we'll grade it so that way the cut and fill is, is it's, it's, um, balanced. So I, I have another quick question and that, that is in regards to foundation. So obviously you're not going to be using the existing foundation of the house. So you're going to have to be putting in a new foundation and wh how far out is the, is the foundation going? Cause you're, you're basically moving further into the, into the buffer zone. Is there a foundation under, I imagine that's a deck and all that kind of stuff, or is just the foundation under the darker filled area. It's the, just going to be a foundation under the darker filled area. The proposed deck would just have piers with potentially smaller sauna tube. Okay, great. Thank you. What's the percent impervious coverage on the existing house and the percent impervious coverage on the proposed? Including the driveway, because the driveway is significantly larger. I'll have to look. I don't have those calculations off the top of my head. That would be great to learn. I'll put that on a table of land use, Doreen, on the resubmissions that way. Thank you. Thank you. The only reason why I ask is that it really, those, those things affect the wetlands. I think everything we're talking about deals with impacting the wetlands. And we have to be sure we don't do that. But don't forget, we also need to be considering um, the floodplain, which we don't have any information on. Would you also, when you could you also draw in there the um, the existing footprint and compare the the dimensions of the existing to that, <clears throat> and then also you're going to check the existing footprint. Yes, we have the okay. Yeah, you have um, oh, your application. Uh, your application repeatedly talks about at the same location, the same. It's not, but I'd like to see this. I'd like to see that on the plan. And also, you're going to have to deal with, you know, if, if you're compliant or not. With, and with once again, I, I apologize if I missed it, but did you have, do you have impervious, did you have um, 
total impervious surface figures change I, in impervious surface on the lot between the uh, the existing and proposed condition no I'll, I'll have that for the I'll have that for the resubmission yeah not just for the not just for the pavement but the entirety of the of yeah the, no entire impervious area for the pavement yeah. and the buildings and any walkways yep. versus existing right yes yes I'll have I'll, I'll have uh, in the table of land use yeah um, and I'll, I'll have that in a chart existing impervious area and proposed impervious area so just okay. to be clear, are we are we going to get a plan that shows the existing conditions, and then a, then the the plan that has the new, the proposed? Because it's hard to see them. I mean, it's nice to see them laid on top of each other, but it's also good to see them side by side as well. <clears throat> I do. You you should have been you should have received an existing conditions plan that depicted uh, just the existing building, and a layout plan that has both super both the existing and the proposed. I, I did not have that in this presentation. Oh, I, I apologize. I, I think I remember seeing that in the, yeah, I'm sorry. And also it might, it might be very important to square things away with um, the state and, and I call the Army Corps of Engineers the federal agency, but you know, they are what they are. Um, to square away where that the delineated wetland boundary is going to be your important key factor. I know you have a wetlands person, but if the DEC, for example, comes up with this is the wetland boundary and this is our jurisdiction, um, that could change the whole face of this application. Understood. I understood. Also, also we got a um, we, in our in the memo from Keller and Sessions. There's a there's a note that there is a small area of disturbance not within the wetland buffer, but within the wetland area proper. Is, can, do you know what that is? Is yeah, that, that the was, proposed retaining wall? That was actually, I apologize. That was actually a bit of a typo. Um, I'll show you that. Oh, wow, I didn't know I could do that. So right over, um, right over here, you can see, I apologize for that. Um, the great right over here and that that that's what I'm going to do what we're going to show on the revised plans is we're going to pull these contours back up over here we're going to basically be putting the back over here at elevation 8 um, to try to pull pull this wall over here back as well as any of the proposed grading behind the building we'll do the um, basically the minimum we can we would have to grade to purport to create a septic system that works uh, and that'll be approvable for the health department and try to bring these contours way back over here. Yeah, I'm looking at them side by side now and I have to agree with Tony that, you know, the, and, and uh, uh, Commissioner Newfeld that when you look at them side by side, referring to them as being on the same footprint is not, is not accurate, so. It's significantly bigger. It's, 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 I, ap it's, I apologize it's for that. I wasn't trying to. I wasn't trying to pull a fast one. Um, basically, I was. Oh, no. My no, thought no, I'm not. Was I'm, not, I'm, not I'm not inferring that. I'm just. I'm no, just, I know. I'm just. I just want to be clear. I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to be. Uh, you understand? Yeah. Duplicitous. There you go. Your your rainwater harvest tank is going to be used for what? Uh, basically what we're going to do is all of the uh, gutters and stuff are going to drain into the rainwater harvesting tank. The rainwater harvesting tank is going to have a small pump in that that's going to handle the water for uh, any type of irrigation that's going to happen on the site. Um, so the applicant's going to work with uh, a landscape architect to finalize their plan on what they want to do there and how they have to do that and we're going to um, use the rainwater harvesting tank, which is a green practice. And we've had really good luck with them in the past on a number of different applications to cut, uh, handle water quantity as well as quality. There's no net increase in our, in our LWRP. <laughs> There's no, you know, for, quali for uh, quantity. So we have a rule on that. I'm sure it's in our code somewhere. Yes. Um, Again, I'll, I'll be explicit with this. There's a lot of disturbance on this property and it would behoove you as representative for the applicant and the applicant 
not to get too far deep with further planning of all of this stuff until those wetland buffers and those wetland areas are confirmed by DEC and if the Army Corps of Engineers has any jurisdiction. Um, and if that's the case, oh, you're you're over an acre, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Our site is, is over site an acre. Acre? Yes. You might have to do a speedies permit too. I'm just saying these things not based on your presentation, but based on um, past experience with applications and sizes and where they are. Understood. Doreen, Doreen, is, Doreen, is this? Be, be happy about with me for this one, but um, just a question on the coastal assessment form. Um, to note that this is not adjacent to a critical environmental area with Delancey Cove behind it. Is that, is that right? Um, I, I'm not sure what the definition of critical environmental area is. But but they're mapped, so we can, we can find out. Yeah, by the sound, isn't it? The sound is a critical environmental area, and I believe that area is. Well, you have the Long Island well, Sound, um, CEA, and we also have a locally designated Critical environmental area. Several. I believe it's on a significant. Is it? It might be in a significant fish and, and wildlife habitat area. Yeah, and, and and they did yeah, so, note that. They, they so did it's not. Yeah. So it's not in a locally designated. It's not a locally designated CEA. Okay. okay. Thank you. There was something on the CEF that I noticed was wrong, but um, I don't know what I did with my notation of that. The other thing is, is this is vastly incomplete as far as the narrative, as far as a lot of different information. Um, you know, so hopefully this is a conceptual review and not a preliminary consistency review. Maureen, that's a good point. And at this, you know, obviously one thing that we're gonna to need to do is have our own environment, environmental consultant look at this, but there is, there's so much potentially in play here um, that like i don't even want to you know um, so I, it's up to you sure to have the environmental consultant look at it because i get the feeling that significant portions of this may change so it's, it's up to you whether you want to call it concept or preliminary at this point because um it's it's a type two action and the planning board has deemed it a type two action um you can do consistency at any time those names that we've put on on the um the way that we're hearing these items, they aren't in the code. So it's really just kind of just no, general just terminology. Asking. Yeah. Right. Greg, did the planning board circulate their intent for lead agency? They did not because it's a type two. You're it's not required. It's, a, it's the single family, correct? That's, a That's correct. Family. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I get that, but um, so it's, well, there's no permit requirement from us, but um, our LWRP, when it talks about critical environmental areas, um, our LWRP essentially says it bumps it up to a type one action um, because it's in a wetlands and critical environmental well, maybe, area. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, first off, I don't, I, I don't think that's accurate. And secondly, it's not next to a, a locally designated critical environmental area. Well, it, it is. is. It's adjacent to a CEA. It is. No, it's not. Okay. Well, if you look at the map, the map has. I just looked at the map. Okay. Well, so Greg, what, you, oh, what you're saying so. is that the Delancey Cove there, that's that's not um, designated that way, that's right? That's not a CEA, no. Locally designated. There is a Westchester County CEA, which right. is everything south of Boston Post Road. Oh, well, I guess um, east of Boston Post Road, or sorry, yeah, east of Boston Post Road. Um, it's but that, that applies to all the properties. Well, if you take a look, there's the Hammocks Conservation Area that was designated in 85, and, and this area on that one that I'm staring at, which is on the DEC site, has the pink colored, let's see, it is adjacent. Um, it says it's, a, yeah, the Grecian Point, it's, it's a, it's a, it says here adjacent CEA, so it's an adjacent area, but yeah. If you take a look, at, it's on the uh, DECV under Hammocks PDF, that's where it is. 
a critical environmental area by nature of its designation. Yeah, um, the, any work in it um, may have, because of its nature, um, may have significant effects. And in our LWRP, it talks about um, bumping up for floodplains, wetlands, and uh, tidal and, and freshwater wetlands. Um, we that's supposed to be bumped up to a type one action. Um, if it's unlisted and it, and in certain yeah, circumstances, yeah. yeah. It's by virtue it's of our two. LWRP approval and the federal and state laws that implement it. Yeah. It's already been approved in 1985, six, four, whatever year it was. I'll find that site for you, Greg. I know Seeker has changed, but um, our LWRP hasn't, and we ha we don't have an update that's been um, approved either, so it still stands. You can have local designations that are more restrictive and more. It just can't be less. Okay, let's let's anyway. keep this moving forward, though. Do, do we have any any other discussion with the applicant necessary for them uh, to, to, to come back and really there? Yeah. I think the applicant ought to come back and address what it wants to do. If it's compliant, if it's not zoning compliant, I guess they got to go for variance first. But that's see, looks like let, let them look at what they want to do first. I have confidence that we'll be able to get that feat um, to, 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 to off of the driveway. As far as that, that's, I believe, our only question with uh, the zoning. So we shouldn't have a problem with addressing that. Is there a CIHA line in here any place? No, there's not, because this Delancey Cove is, um, it's kind sheltered. of already shielded. It's sheltered. Yeah. <coughs> So we're going to keep this as a conceptual, not a preliminary review. This way we're not tied to um, timing and give the applicant the opportunity. There might be a way to get a jurisdictional determination from the DEC, um, but I'm not too sure about how that works with Army Corps of Engineers or if they have any jurisdiction there anyway. Um, <coughs> And for certain Army Corps of Engineers permits, even if they're nationwide, this is a residential development, um, stormwater, those are the areas in which the Department of State does consistency with us on. So I'm not sure, but you, you really need to explore those before you get ahead of yourself um, for the applicant's uh, pocketbook. Let's put it that way. The reason why I say that is if you have a plan developed and then you find out, uh-oh, now we need to switch it because of jurisdictional wetlands and other you know, determinations, um, you can save yourself a lot of time by doing this first step. Understood. Thank you. Okay. I think that may be as far as we can get with this, appli with, with this application this evening. Um, Chairman, you have a member of the public that's raising their hand. Well, then we should definitely hear from them. Okay. Should I stop sharing my screen or, or we can? Uh, yes. Okay, sorry about that. Pull that down. All right. Hey, Stuart, you should be able to speak now. Okay, thank you. Um, has a SWIT been submitted for this project? It has not. Okay. Will have to be. Or a storm man water management plan? No, it has not. Okay. So I see it's before the planning board also. Have they asked for those from you? We're working, we're going to be working with the consulting engineer, with the village's consulting engineer to develop a stormwater management plan. That's good. Okay. Be and just procedurally, I think somebody referred to a memo from Keller and Sessions. It's not on the um, agenda, the stuff that's listed for the public. So, and it really should be. Um, because I would explain what's going on and probably explain that there's not a split. So I don't know if the board has that in front of you, but it seems like somebody had that. 
Yeah, I, I Stuart, I have um, there is a there is a May eighteen um, memo, and okay. I don't know why it wasn't included in the materials. I'm, I'm sure know. Betty, I don't get that. Up. Timing yeah. issue. Um, it is on the planning board. Well, it might be a different one, but it's probably got how, some how is similar it coded, content. Greg? Is it coded somehow differently? I mean, I'm looking at it now, HCZMC, and I can't identify anything that would be a Keller. And yeah, we'll, we'll add it. I, I'm not seeing that either. But um, okay. if you if you do want to see, there is one for the planning board that is on the agenda from last week for the planning board um, that addresses. Probably similar, yes. probably the same language. So it's the same memo Chairman Burt's speaking of? I'll let the, Brian the comments speak. are the, I can speak to that. Hi, Brian Hildenbrand, Kellard Sessions. Um, it's the same comments for the planning, the planning board received. And okay. um, it's uh, comment number one is requesting. Um, and that was the 5-4 or the 5-6 meeting? Um, the... the Five thirteen. Five thirteen. They've had so many meetings. Um, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I'm seeing it here. It's the last document. Recent point. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah, thanks, it, uh, Stuart. It addresses um, stormwater and and SWIP at. Uh, Paragraph two on the second page. Okay, I'll take a look at it. Thank you. Okay, that's, I think that's uh, as far as we can get with this application tonight. Um, thank you all for your time and your comments. We look forward to seeing you guys uh, in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thank you. All right. It is, it's awfully late. And uh, so I would like to keep moving without a break if people are able to do that. We have a, nope. um, for the work session items, uh, we've had people waiting, I'm sure, extremely patiently for uh, the discussion of public works in sensitive area. Uh, I, I want to move that up in the agenda and take it next uh, so that we can get, let some people go to bed. <laughs> no. We're not off the hook. Uh, Greg, we had, had, we have, we have a guest waiting patiently for us. Are you talking about Stuart? No, I, I thought we had DPW. No, um, I sent him and, and notified, um, DPW, but they're, they're not here. What? So. Come again. They're, they're not here. I, <laughs> Did, did someone confirm with you that they would be coming? Um, because I, you know, I reached out to them. I can't control them coming or not coming to, to the meeting, so. So why to be- um... That was not my understanding. Okay. We're gonna have to uh, discuss that with the village manager. That's actually the second, that's yep. the second time. There's, this, is the, this is the second non-appearance. Because we asked Greg, Greg, didn't you ask the first time? Yep, Last I've asked meeting? both times. Yep. yep. Okay, I know we, I know we have a member of the public uh, who pays a whole lot of attention to um, environmental concerns and working in sensitive areas, and uh, I, I'm just going to put on the record we have, we have made uh, Mr. Tickert's uh, letter and photographs. Uh, part of the record. I, I've said before um, enough times I can't remember where I said it, uh, that what I really want to have is, is uh, not, a, not a discussion about a particular job, but a discussion about process um, so that you know, we as a commission understand how DPW uh, incorporates 
uh, best practices for work in environmentally sensitive areas like uh, beside the Maranek River, wetlands, sensitive places, so that uh, they are uh, thinking about the problems we think about, uh, worrying about environmental damage, and using best practices. I don't think that I have a good understanding of how and at what level they incorporate those things. I don't know if any other commissioner feels like they do, but I certainly don't. I want to have somebody I can talk to who can walk through that as part of our, our public hmm, oversight role. Uh, I thought I was clear that uh, the village manager was going to have um, Tony Acavelli uh, come here tonight and have that discussion with us. Uh, I thought I was as transparent as possible about uh, what it was we wanted to talk about. Somehow uh, we had a miscommunication and we don't have someone here who can answer any of the questions uh, I have. Uh, it is, uh, I think, I would say it's unfortunate that uh, Stuart Tickert has, has stayed up with us um, all evening waiting for that, but I know Stuart is extremely attentive to public meetings and probably would be watching anyway. Hi, Stuart. <laughs> um, that is that is really unfortunate and not uh, and and not productive, Stuart. Uh, given that you've been patient, if you want to say anything, uh, I'll give you the opportunity to do so. Well, the only thing I would say is I wasn't expecting Tony Acavelli there, um, so I'm not totally disappointed. Um, you know, I'm happy the board is taking up this topic. I, you know, and I'm happy to speak about what I think is problematic about how our village staff deals with stormwater management issues on our property. And I think it really goes back to when we adopted our stormwater management plan that we never really did the public and staff education on the top. So I think this will be a good exercise. I commend you for doing it, and um, I'm not disappointed I stayed up. I'm not sure if you can have a discussion about any of the issues. I think the short-term issue is to get a more sufficient way to keep all the discharge from the parking lot and from um, the disturbed earth there from going into the stream bed. Um, I think as I wrote you, they put up cell fence, they put up hay bales, but it could be done better. And I'm sure there's guidance to say how it could be. And then there's the long-term solution. It's clearly an issue. I mean, ultimately, probably it should be something serious like a catch basin there to a, you know, treatment and then on to the river. But um, as I said, I'm grateful for you taking it up and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks for your input. Um, well, Thomas, can I make one comment? I yeah. often travel by that area. Um, I agree with what Mr. Tickert says, and I agree that we're trying to get um, a better handle on, on this situation. However, we're not considering something that's pretty important that happens either all too frequently or not that frequently. There's a um, notice that there's more sedimentation in that area of the river, but that's actually a designated wetland. So um, maybe in addition to trying to get this back on the agenda, we might have some discussions with a long-term plan solution with a wetland restoration there because um, I know it's not going to happen overnight, uh, but I know the county uh, does have a program for that. They did it in Columbus Park. And uh, we, as a commission, work with the village manager to secure grants, and this is the perfect opportunity to get one started as in the face of the public that parks there that goes to the city if we ever get back there. Yeah, we, we um, did apply to do some restoration on that um, stream bank of, I think it was like 2014 um, and removing the invasives, which I mentioned before. 
And yes, they did do Columbus Park up until up until the first pedestrian bridge. Um, the county did a project right. there. They kind of pulled back for a long period of time on doing projects like that. And we heard, um, you know, when there was kind of a change in the administration that they would start, um, you know, doing doing similar projects moving forward. Um, however, I am a little concerned that money might dry up at this point in time um, to do projects like that. Um, and I will agree well, with you. And I will agree with you that there is a wetland in that location of the river. Well, I will say this because we have an LWRP. I don't know if you received any information on the Environmental Protection Fund grants. We can get a grant very easily because we have an LWRP. We're fast tracked. We're ahead of the line mm -hmm. to do the planning and then the implementation. The planning really needs to start as soon as possible because implementing it um, will need to happen in the long term. But the sedimentation is increasing in that area. And I'm not only thinking it, of it as the wetland, but now I'm thinking of, and also thinking of, it's, it's a major place where flash flooding occurs. And when you have silt in the river like that, not good. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we have been looking at that LWRP grant. Um, at this point in, in our conversations with our grant writers, we were kind of looking to submit for the, um, the Rushmore side. Uh, not the Rushmore side, I'm sorry, the, the West Basin um, to do some of that seawall work um, continuing up, you know, down the seawall and trying to in, you know, plant native plantings and kind of do some resiliency work along that, that portion of the seawall where it's failing. But I do believe we can submit more than one application. Um, so that's a worthwhile um, project, I think, to recommend to the board and, um, you know, see if they want to prioritize it. Okay, we, we have discussion items that I'm, I'm going to at this point uh, take out of order again, uh, because I know um, we need to address the outfall jetty, if only to report. Um, Andrew, it's, you are more familiar with it than I am, but I, I'll just briefly, where we're at with that is we have reached out to the county, but we've had difficulty uh, closing the loop on communication uh, because we have uh, a, a a view that it would be beneficial for both the county and us if they would take a little input on uh, on the uh, outfall jetty project before they uh, complete it. I'm, I'm a little, uh, I, I would have hoped that we would by now uh, be farther along in that communication than we are. Uh, Andrew, do you want to add to that? Uh, just real quickly, uh, so, Mr. Barbieri did send out a, uh, an email. I saw that, uh, Greg and Betty, we have not heard, we have not received a response from the County on that. Not that I'm aware of, but, um, I am a master of nagging people. So I will follow up on that. <laughs> okay. And ju just real quick, uh, again, I spoke to Mr. Ressler about this, uh, and that was a big part of our two and a half hour conversation. Um, Originally, I, I wasn't really very inspired by the county's uh, plan for the park and the, the plantings and the benches there. Um, but upon closer examination, uh, the the bumping out of the uh, of the uh, jetty with this uh, additional sheet piling and now the riprap, which will be a, a further uh, intrusion into a busy channel and a fully developed harbor and some of the environmental concerns about putting the riprap there and then having to remove the riprap when the with a new sheet piling uh, has to be replaced in 30 or 40 years. Uh, th there's some very com compelling uh, reasons all, all the way around to, to kind of relook at this and according to um, uh, pe uh, people that were on the Harbor Coastal Commission when this uh, first came up in 2016, this uh, this matter fell into our jurisdiction. According to Mr. Restler, it's within our purview. Uh, it appears the proper procedure was not, uh, the, they, they went for Department of State consistency without consulting us, um, which was improper procedure. We have, we have a remedy 
which is, is, which is to go to the Secretary of State, according to Mr. Ressler, and report on the um, lack of uh, process here with the, with the Department of State, the Secretary uh, of State's job is to supervise uh, all other state agencies. So, well, you know, we don't want to go that route. We'd, we'd much rather have a dialogue. And I think that from what I understand, they're, they're willing to discuss these things with us. And there is a certain amount of money that they're giving, a substantial amount of money they're giving to the village uh, for improvements. Um, but uh, the, the, the danger here is that the longer this goes, it, it, it's kind of already into the process. And the longer it goes without any kind of communication, they show up with uh, contractors uh, tomorrow and uh, start working. It's going to it's going to be a mess. So, I I really like to get some communication uh, and and let the let the county know that uh, we we want to talk about this sooner rather than later. So, if Greg, you could help with that. Maybe uh, Thomas and I can call uh, the village manager again tomorrow. Seems we have a couple things to talk to him about. Um, you know, I, I think it's an important look. It's a very important thing. It's a prime piece of real estate. It could really make an impact on the harbor. It could really make an impact on the park, and uh, uh, the the current plans, although they've they've been gone over with uh, DEC and other agencies, th there, there's some things we should really talk about, and that's where I'm at with it. Well, Andrew, the other part of this too is, is the marine structures permit is warranted by our code before any construction happens, and should they show up with equipment. I would I would hope that they would come to the table because they really need a marine structures permit for the riprap and the bulkhead um, that's in our code. So um, it might behoove us to put that on the table to say, hey, you know, I know you went to these other agencies, but there's one permit that you need to obtain from the village of Mamaroneck. Um, the village of Mamaroneck holds an underwater land grant in the beach area. So, you know, that's another issue um, that yes. it's encroached and, on. There's a yes. lot to this. Yes, and, and the bump out of the four feet, the new sheet piling wall and the rip wrap, which isn't going to be another four feet. It'll be maybe 15 Eight. feet or 20 feet. So that's, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that, that's quite a bit of intrusion into the channel quite a bit of coverage over land that, that they don't own. Uh, it really has to be looked at. I, I think it, I, 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 I was originally okay with the construction and I was just worried about the surface and, and the, uh, the, the, the superficial use of the, of the land. But after speaking to Mr. Ressler and looking into this, the, the whole thing concerns me. And I really don't want to upset the apple cart, especially if they're giving the village uh, half a million to three quarters of a million dollars for other improvements, but I, I think we have to talk about this and at, and at least have a discussion and a dialogue. Definitely. I mean, no doubt about it. And the other thing it impacts is, um, you know, how our harbor operates on, on the other side of the beach because there's going to be intrusion into that area which is utilized for work floats and the like and you know anybody comes in dredging and so on and so forth um look they need to secure their their pipe i understand that but um we all have to work together and come up with a plan that's going to be beneficial and meet our laws you know our local laws because they might have permits from other agencies but those permits say it's subject to ours too yeah. yeah. Okay, it's folks. Definitely we've, a procedural issue. We we've now been uh, going four and three hours, and while we've uh, we've always been willing to work hard on this commission, um, I I I will tell you that I'm not 100, percent and I am losing my ability to uh, to do meaningful deliberative work. We have two other um, uh, work session issues: uh, wetland law and LWRP update. Would anybody be terribly offended if we push those over to the next meeting? Because I'm, I'm really getting to to my limit of the ability to move a, a, a complex agenda item forward tonight. Thomas, didn't didn't we already on the wetland law basically approve it? And um, to follow up on the last meeting, I was to do a little research on the notification as Greg brought up. Um, can't we just like? spend a minute or two and, and deal with that so we can get it off to the Board of Trustees because 
we're having big problems with wetlands. Well, on uh, wetland law, yeah, I think we've we've come a long way on that. Um, it uh, we went around the horn for comments last time, and we were down to minimal. Uh, Doreen, you had one follow-up item. If you can report on that, real quickly um, on the notification, the wetlands law deals with not only us, but it also deals with other agencies, uh, the DEC. And as far as notification is concerned. Um, there's a party of interest, and it goes through our clerk treasurer's office. So it's a little different than most land use applications. And I don't think there can be a set notification zone because you might be across the pond from somebody or so on and so forth. So um, yes, I looked sir. at various versions of our wetlands law, and none of them had notification at all. And I know people have to put a sign up on their property. Um, I don't think we could codify this to be a certain distance because of the way that, you know, things are situated in wetlands. Well, that, that may not be a complete answer, though. As I understood Greg's concern, to the extent possibly wanted to make sure that it was consistent with other notice statutes. That doesn't mean that you can't include something like, uh, you know, visible and facing from a body of water or something that's specific to what it concerns. But, but that, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to harmonize it. Yeah, so I think the but board I, at the time I, was talking I, about- <clears throat> of interest on a hill, you know, living a hundred, a thousand feet away. You can be a party of interest to any wetland application. We can be a party of interest in a wetland application in Scarsdale because it affects our community with the Department of State. We can go outside of our community and participate and impact, you know, if it has impacts to us because of the watershed, you know, that I'd be more concerned about than the individual notification zone here in the village. Yeah, so right now we have a 100 foot notification. Um, it's really small. It usually ends up being just two properties, like the neighbors or maybe someone across the street. And it's um, done off of the boundary of the property. Um, within 100 feet of the boundary of the property on which the proposed regulated activity will be located. Um, so the thing that, that I wanted to clarify was just to make it more consistent. So the language on the sign is different than some of the other languages that we put on signs. Um, the, the notification, the village has to do the notification. So we actually mail them out every other type of application. The applicant is responsible for mailing out the notification. Um, it also has a 15 day um, prior to the, to the hearing. It has to be mailed out. Every other board does 10 days. So I just kind of wanted to make it kind of fit. So, And there's no requirement for a sign posting. That's right. Right. Could yeah, There's yeah. Not, correct. Yeah, okay. correct. Could be done. Well, yeah. what, we, what we need is a proposed new provision. And I don't think we, we, we've got Greg's suggestions for what it should look like, but we haven't drafted that. I, I think we have to put that over. Um, maybe right, I so. can call Matt, uh, maybe I'll call Matt Miraglio at the Department of State to gain a little bit more information on that um, since we haven't really come to a conclusion and report back. How's that? Okay, well then let's work and group it. Doreen, that's gonna be you and me. You you get the information that you want. I'll, I'll uh, try to draft a, a, a um, notice proposal that fits with the other ones. Uh, and then this will be on for next time and hopefully that'll be a vote. Motion. Can I make a suggestion that we do the LWRP update um, earlier in the agenda, like maybe first on the agenda since we We've been missing doing it for over a year. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so for the June meeting, we'll try to do the LWRP first and have a vote on the wetlands law, and then we'll deal with applicants. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, is there Did anyone look at minutes? Hold, hold, hold on. I took a quick look at minutes, Betty Ann, but I but I didn't have the time to go through it and make sure that I was comfortable with everything it said. So I'm also okay. going to put that over. I'm sorry, but I am. No problem. Uh, Seamus? Yeah, just on the LWRP, nothing to prolong this meeting. But is there a document, a red line or something that was planned to be shared around? I just don't think yeah. I've seen it yet. Yeah, I thought I saw it. 
Yeah, I've done red line and I provided it to the chair and vice chair. Um, and I think they're still reviewing it. Um, no. Yes. My question is only, is that something that we want to have all of us have looked at before the next meeting or not? Yeah, I think yeah. before the before the next work session, we should have the, the opportunity to circulate it to everybody. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so somebody moved, moved to close the meeting. Oh, yeah. I'll move. All in favor? Aye. 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 If I could just say something real quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah before you hang up. Yeah, this is my last meeting with with you all. So um, I, I wish you the best of luck. It's been a pleasure working with Greg, all of you. Yeah. So what, what, where yeah, are you going? Greg, are you are you moving on? What's good? What's happening? Yeah, I'm I'm going to uh, Scarsdale. Oh, congratulations! Thank you. Yeah. Greg, I I appreciate your knowledge and your diligence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've really you. loved working with you over the years and CFT, all that kind of stuff. You've been great. So. Best Thank you. Life. Yeah, you'll be Thank missed. You. Very Sorry, I couldn't see you all in person. But Greg, you're not moving, so I can pick my disc, are you? <laughs> I, I'm not moving. No. no, I'll still be a Mamaroneck resident. So. <laughs> I'm only kidding. We'll I'll eventually get that back from you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, folks. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Okay. Good. Have a good evening. Well. Go better, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs>